Oh man. Ole. What's up, my brother? How you doing? How you doing? Always drinking. Always, you know, I'm, I'm, I got a mix today. You know, I got a coffee to keep me up. How do you? Cause you don't, you don't smoke, right? I do not smoke. How do you be dealing with niggas be up here smoking. No, nah, I, I don't mind. Well, really, oh, someone else is coming in. Hey, come on. Yeah. Um, so, usually, I mean, I don't really do too well around smoke, but I don't really mind. I don't care. Like, if people smoke, I don't care. Like, in this studio, this is a good thing about us owning this studio. Like, I don't care where people smoke. Like, so they smoke on set, smoke everywhere. Because, you know, you want to get people come to them. It ain't, you know, that big of a deal. But I personally don't smoke. I never really got into it. I'm guessing you, you drink, smoke? And I feel like I'm in the presence of a living legend, man. I remember, yo, listen, before as a kid, when I was, when I had like just aspirations of being in the music industry, let me put the mic a little bit closer. I remember watching, I remember like, number, first of all, all these things just seem so far. Like, because you, you watch music videos on BET and MTV and you see like these people in music, and you're like, damn, like, it's no way I could even ever even be mentioned in the same sentence caliber as some of these people. And I remember watching making a band and I'm like, yo, like this is, it was pretty much almost damn near the first, Hey, we're going to take some talented, regular people. We're making them stars. Yeah, it was the, the first all black reality is dealing with music. Cause you had the first installment, which was old town, but they was like a boy band. Oh, they were before y'all? Yeah, it was before us. We was the all first all black reality um, show cast that was dealing with music. Yo, so uh, let me just do an intro real quick. Hey, <laughs> welcome to another episode of Off the Record Podcast. I'm sitting here, if, and I know my audience has spanned uh, probably about like, like last night I was thinking about it. I said, not only maybe I'm getting old, but like I've been doing this so long, I had to go back and look at my material from seven years ago to reference myself. Okay. And I'm like, damn, I've been in shit, this shit a, a long time. Now I say that to say, I know there's people that listen to me that are pushing 50. And I know there's people that listen to me who are still in high school. And that's a very beautiful situation. That's so there's- that's a, that's a that's a kind of nice little window. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And for some people, Y'all might be like, oh, shit. Y'all got him on here. Like, I, I fuck with him. And some of y'all might be like, explain to me Who what's fuck? going on. <laughs> uh, ladies and yeah. gentlemen, I got Enes in the building. Enes. Um, You guys may know him, one of Philly's, you know, finest. He was, at least his initial claim to fame was, you know, being a part of a very historical story, being a part of the band. Um, one of the first time ever we saw a hip-hop Artists and we've there's many shows now. Hey, you know all these talent shows for hip hop artists, but this was the or origin. Okay. This is what's still being talked about. Yeah. This is still where some of the stories and even the the Chappelle show that parried so much of it, you know, uh, originated from. So you know we got Enes in the building for sure. My brother, I'm so happy to have Shout you. Shout out the big act. What's up, act? Listen, uh, it, it, when I get to interview people that when I was a kid, like I was like, and again, I was thinking that this music industry shit is so far. <clears throat> so I'm like, I would never even be in the position to even sit here with you. I would That's never. Crazy, right? Seriously, it, 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 it shows a different dynamic. But I do want to give a lot of people who might be a little bit, they're like, okay, well, we don't really know the story. I know the story very well, but we do have to go back. And um, I want you to give the story of how, you know, you even ended up being on um, making a band, okay. and obviously, you know, I I know you come from Philly. Right. There's a lot. There's a lot of weight on your shoulders coming right. from Philly. I remember <laughs> watching you on that show. You oh, come shit. from the home of the spitters. Yeah, I was I was forced. I wouldn't say forced because we all have relationships. But just to just to answer your question, I come from Philly. It's a real competitive city. Yeah, yeah. We, we come in the land of the. We from the land of the deep. We we are known as the home of the spitters. Why is that? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how we got that moniker, but being so close to New York and Jersey, it's like this trifecta, New New, New Jersey, New York, Philly. It, it, it's interesting why Philly's known as the home of the spirits, because, of course, New York, the Mecca, there's a lot of, you know, dudes that came through and, you know, were lyrically, you know, superior, this and third, but it's something about the grittiness, the, you know, 
always with, yeah. quick with the bars when it comes right. to Philly. And I mean, what are we talking about? You, Beanie Siegel, Freeway. We're talking about Cassidy. Yeah. This is a reputation that's just continued. Yeah. And when uh, uh, you, I, I'm going to give you the story, but, or I want you to tell me the story right. in terms of how, uh, when you get selected as the only Philly artist, mm -hmm. what are you thinking at that point? Um, just, you know, I was holding down the East Coast at that time. Uh, like I said, we come from Philly. It's a real competitive city. And we, I came up in a DVD area. Shout out to Big Star, Too Raw for the Streets. That was like the first outlet because I was fresh out of jail. I came home May 17th of 2000. I made That's the show. That's my birthday. Where? May 17th is my birthday. Yeah, so I, I made the show September 2000. You want to like a casket call or something? Yeah. Like wait online and everything? Yeah. But let me show you how I got to that point. Yeah. I have been, um, I come from Barton Village Projects. Is is is, is um, housing um project South Southwest Philadelphia, um you know it's just public housing. You know what I'm saying so, um I befriended uh, a producer from a neighborhood named Black Key. Yeah. Black Key was uh you know he helped develop me as an artist, taught me how to do um bars, count bars, and do choruses. Just creating my whole song structure. Bring you up to speed. He ended up landing two big songs on um, DMX's Great Depression album. Really? He did the beats for Who We Be and We Right There, which was the two lead singles off that that album, which propelled that album to go platinum. Oh, so wow. he had a little relationship with, with with the movers and shakers inside the game. So I signed a production deal straight out of jail. May 17, 2000, I signed the deal with um, Black Key Production, and we began shopping my demo. Wait, so uh, at this point... Mm -hmm. How does he know, like, you have that ability to really give it up? Like, Because he, he helped you, develop me. I was okay. the little kid from the, from, the, from the projects. They used to break out the, um, the turntables and the DJ equipment and hook up a mic. And then everybody from the neighborhood would come out and, and, and rap. You know what I'm saying? And I was that the young guy. You know what I'm saying? And I stepped up. And I had a lot of energy. I didn't really know the know-how. But I had the energy. And they seen something in me. And from that day on, he helped develop me. And w w back then, was it like how... And even it was depicted on the band, right? Mm -hmm. where, where it's like, or making the band, where, where it's like, yo, all right, cool. Like, because we've heard these stories about um, DMX, or is it DMX and like maybe JC Ballard? Right, right, like, right. were you like the person that were like, yo, all right, everybody's like kicking it, be like, yo, maybe not necessarily a rap battle, but like, yo, you got to show up and prove live, right? That's what it was all about. I really? rap for DNY, I rap for Timberland, I rap for DMX. I was actually supposed to sign to DMX's imprint on Bloodline. Really? And then I was moonlighting um, with Miss J. She was signed to B Club, Timberland's label at the time. So that's how we come to the whole story, me making the band. I was moonlighting with her. She went up to um, um, pr promo one of her singles, which was called Ching, Ching, Ching. The one featuring Nelly Furtado. Mm -hmm. I went up there, I freestyled. You know what I mean? The program director took a liking to me, which was Jay Black from 103.9. We, we exchanged numbers, and he just said, anything that comes down, come, come, comes past my radar, I'm, I'm going to put you D with it. Lo, lo and behold, the Making the Band comp competition in MTV um, did the competition with 103.9, which he was the program director. Ooh. So I got the heads up to do the audition. I didn't have no special treatment. I had came down and auditioned just like everybody else. I just How do you prepare for something like that? You don't. You don't. But me spending time in jail, I had time to write a lot of material. Whereas before, before I got locked up, I wasn't focused. I was in the street. I started working odd jobs. So I wasn't really focused on making music. So when I was locked up, that time that I spent, I just took that time and used that time to write a lot of material. So by the time I came home, I just was recording songs and I had um, verses for freestyles and I just had verses for everything. So it didn't even matter. Back then, I used to look at rap like... I look at rap rappers mm -hmm. like superheroes, right? Like, oh, for sure. And, and I'm, I'm gonna tell you why because I was like, I would like first of all, the memory was like crazy because you know I, it was. I remember the day I saw a rapper like rap from his phone. I was like, oh, you right, like right, right. You, 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 you messed you up my whole. You it's, fell in love with hip hop. Yeah, you know, it, it's yeah. like I, I remember that there was a time. It's like believing wrestling is like what it is, right? And. um yeah, so, so so you're writing all these raps in jail. Writing raps in jail. End up getting an um, opportunity to freestyle on the radio with Miss G. One thing led to another. The competition came to Philly. I auditioned. Didn't make Are the you first nervous? audition. I was nervous as hell. Nervous as fuck. Fucked up on your bars? I didn't know what, what rhyme to spit. You I did some eight miles. I, I never fucked up on my bars, though. Not one time. Not one time. I only had two auditions yeah, before yeah. We, we was on a callback list to um, audition in front of Puff on 42nd Street in New York. But when I got the call, when I, I made the second. Okay, so... 
just just give you a summary of the show. They they did a national talent scout. They went to L.A., they went to Philly, New York, Miami, and Baltimore, and New Orleans. Mm. So they went to all these places and scouted talent. Why did they go to Atlanta? Atlanta niggas have bars? I know Atlanta niggas. <laughs> niggas, had, niggas from Atlanta had to drive to these cities. Oh, damn. Yeah, so that's what it was like. So, bang, I had got the heads up. Auditioned once. It was like a lot of people. The line was around the corner, so yeah. I really didn't get a lot of time to rap. The second time, a lot of people were discouraged, so the line wasn't as long. They didn't so, make you cut the line? No. No, I had, to, I had to get a line just like everybody else. But... I spit one of the verses that I spit off the DVDs that became a fan favorite on the DVDs. Yeah, yeah. And that's what got me on a callback list audition in front of Puff. When I got the call, I was actually in Redden, which is like almost an hour and some change away from New York. I was supposed to be in um, New York f for the for the for callback list, 11 o'clock a.m. I didn't leave till 2 o'clock from Redden to go to the audition. So by the time I got there, my cousins had Redden, talked PA? me. Redden, PA. Shout out to Redden, man. Yeah, shout out to Redden. My cousin had just bought a crib out there. So yeah. he was out there celebrating, you know, you know what I'm saying, getting right. And then my cousin Dave called me, yo, New York is calling saying you got to go to New York. You're supposed to be there at 11 o'clock. So me bullshit, not thinking I wasn't going to make it or, you know what I mean, really the competition wasn't for me. You know I'm saying? I just said, fucking, I ain't going. Then the cousins that I was up there with, it was like, man, this, this, this could be your break, bro. You getting older, you fresh out of jail, you didn't got a fucked up record. Like, this may be your shot. Yeah. So we drove up there. I end up getting up there like maybe four or five hours after the calling time, and I just walked after after. So you're supposed to be there at eleven. What you get there at? Like four or five p.m. p.m. Then let you rock. No, I just did a Brody move. I just got out the car, told my cousin to go park the car. I walked past everybody in line and just knocked on the fucking door. Really? And I was like, "Yo, my name is Lloyd Mathis. I'm one of the callbacks from Philly. I was supposed to be here. I said some finesse shit. They was like, you know what? You next." And took me straight from the street into the line audition for P. Diddy. And then that's when I end up getting on stage and busting my ass and a bunch of equipment falling. Yo, that's kind of bold. Crazy. Yeah, I just said, fuck it, because I was already past the time I was supposed to be there. Yo, you really thought you wasn't going to make it, though? Like fuck no. Because, I mean... I didn't have the traditional good looks, you know what I'm saying? To me, as far as yeah, I'm yeah, concerned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. because people, yeah, yeah, yeah. at that time, people thought about a rapper looking a certain way, especially R&B singers. Like, R&B singers had to be the nigga who every girl wanted. And I always touch on this on my topic because people think it's, it's, uh, um, it's a, a personal problem that I have. I'm just stating the, the facts. You in the business, you know mm -hmm. how, how, how much appearance plays a part. I used to think that of myself, too. I, 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 I used to believe... That I had to, that mm -hmm. even sometimes when it wasn't working out I very early on. With you, bro. I, just, I don't even drink with you. <laughs> you know what I'm hey, so I used to think early on, I said, man, maybe this is not working out because I don't got this, like all the girls don't want to fuck me. You don't fit and this, yeah, I don't, I don't fit that criteria, yeah. which I do believe later on the internet broke. But, but at that time, right. I think that definitely mattered, right? Like, it the, definitely matters. Yeah. It definitely, because the bitches going to buy it because they think they go, they want to get up with you. And my man, the niggas want to buy it because they want to be. They want to almost be you yeah. because of the girls you get. Yeah. So so I didn't think I had your traditional um, marketing ability or the parents to actually make something like making a band that I know was going to be on MTV. Because that was like, like the creme de la creme of, you know what I'm saying? Was it known that whoever wins this competition is going to be signed to uh, uh, Puff at the time? Or was it like, you're going to have some industry opportunity? To me, hearing it, going into it, a friend from from, from, from the projects told me Puff was having an um, open audition for his, for his show. I already knew about it from the yeah, yeah. program director. But to me, it was just like American Idol thing. I didn't know it was a group until I got further in the competition. That is the first like nigga American Idol. <laughs> it was like, I didn't talk. know. I thought it was just one winner. And, you know, just one... Oh, you didn't even know it was like a group? I didn't know it was a group until, you know, the actual uh, competition developed. So, yeah, um, went up there, ended up busting my ass. I Wait, missed. let me ask you a question. I know I'm cutting off the no, story. for sure, I'm sorry. for sure, for sure. <laughs> because I imagine at that point, you're like, this is, this is I could tell you're on the... It's so fuck real. It. It's like, so real. Like, yeah, yeah, fuck it. If if I get turned down, get turned down, but I, I got to shoot the shot to feel comfortable that with failure. That anger is with my audition. I got up mad. I got up like with a so, chip on my shoulder. Suppose when you walking past all these people, somebody say, "Yo, whoa, nah, nigga, you ain't with like I could tell you, you probably had that mindset like ain't nothing stopping me." Imagine just going from the street, yeah, watching somebody as like like the impact is puff, 
and watching them because I'm, I'm watching them on a TV and I'm tapping in the Rap City, the top 10 countdown. I'm watching they should hold four. I went to school the whole time. I was still in school my last year when, when Biggie's death. Mm. So I, I watched they whole come up. You know what I'm saying? I, you know what I'm saying? I, born in the late 70s. So 80s, 90s, like I've seen the whole thing from hip hop. Started off with break dancing, got into DJing, and then that turned into rapping. Yeah, yeah. But I always was um, smart. So I ended up going to a smart school in Philadelphia, which was Central High School. Bill Cosby went there, Cassidy, DJ Drama, and me. I be forgetting that drama's from Philly. Drama's from Philly. So That's why he went back, he got, yeah, he got yeah, Uzi, man. Yeah, Salute yeah, the drama. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Salute the drama. So English, reading and writing, was I was big on that. So that helped me in writing rhymes and constructing. So, yeah, I made the show. Um, they caught me like last. They made me sweat it out because I thought wait, I wouldn't. Wait, explain that the, the equipment. So uh, are you in front of Puff? I think that was on the show. It was on the show. But what? So uh, you see we're like how we like. Yeah, we're on the stage. So imagine a bunch of equipment. Just yeah, back yeah, set yeah. Up. So me miscalculating the steps, the footing. Yeah. On this small. Oh, you fucked everything up. I fucked everything up. You got to think at that point. Yeah, I'm done. So, I'm yeah. done. It's over. Why would they want to? You know what I mean? Add me for a group when I can't even I can't even get my my fucking motor skills yeah, right. It's on. looking like you got two left feet. It's like yeah, it's, it's done. Like, like I'm done. But they end up calling me like the next to last. They made me sweat it out and shit. And I'm like, they called me. Then we start doing the physical training. We st we move right into the physical training and just artist development. Like what do you mean physical training? Physical training. We had to get up early in the morning. Like boot camp? Yeah, boot camp. We had to do physical. Are you training. on the show at this point? Yes. Yes. Actually, on a run on the show, I was running from a um, drug case in Philly. So I had, I had stopped reporting, but they only publicized die lines issues, legal issues. They never publicized my legal issues. Oh, so so like, it was a time. Where I so actually, you're going to go, so your, your probation or whatever yes, you're I'm on. really hiding. I'm running on the show. So really? it, was, it came to a point where, you know what I mean, it just got too much for my mother down in Philly. So I had went to Puff and them and told them, I ain't going to be able to part of the show. I got to go back to Philly and deal with my legal issues. And they wrote me a letterhead saying that I could potentially make the show. And that's what got me off. So I was basically in their jurisdiction the whole time after that when I returned to the show. So I would wild out with my group members, but it was only so much I could wild out because yeah, I'm basically yeah, yeah. under their legal care. Yeah, I, that's the wildest. Re that's the wildest, realest. Re Yo, <laughs> yeah, shit crazy. so much question. Like, yeah. uh, like okay, okay. So first and foremost, which by the way, uh, it, when we talk about 2024 music industry present day, no one does artist development. Um, it's kind of, you almost have to have like a, a little buzz yeah, via TikTok man. or something already. They want you already polished. Yeah, you guys were going through this process that we all were watching and it's the origin or it's the origin of how do you make it in the industry that requires everybody to be in shape, everybody to be perfect in terms of media training, everybody has to be on point when it comes to rapping, uh, recording. Where the cheesecake get? Because I'm, I'm about to get into the whole infamous cheesecake yeah, thing. Yeah, no, no, so, no, we about to get there. No, we about to get there. <laughs> but before we, you know, first no, of all. I was saying that to say because it was a military exercise. Yeah. A lot of the industry took it as public humiliation. But Why did you take it? It's, it's a military exercise. At the time, I was young. I just thought he was just on an ego trip making us walk because you got to understand making a band was uncharted territory. They didn't know what to do. Puff Daddy signed the deal and the cameras start rolling. That's why when we come to the studio, he didn't have no itinerary for us. <laughs> yeah, nah, he was like, yo, crazy. just, just do <laughs> this while I can do some time to think. <laughs> Nothing was scripted. You see, as they went on, as the seasons went on, Danny D. Kane and Day 26 is there for from there on. You know, it got a little bit better as far as production wise. But when we man, first started, y'all shit the funniest. Y'all shit it's, is the, it's the realest. most iconic. That's the realest the shit I've iconic. ever seen, man. <laughs> like so the, when he made us walk, it was to make us come together what? as a group, as unity. Yeah. Even though if he was the villain at the moment, yeah. because we had to be on a road to promote the album true, as true. a unity. So it's a, it's, 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 it's it's just a, it's just. It's just a rollout of a military exercise. They do it all the time. Y'all didn't really walk to the Brooklyn though. Like they nah, we took, we, we took stops and we had the van pull up and because the MTV guys was with us. They had to document it. So we, it's a whole production. Oh, so they like, yo, we're not walking. It's a whole here. production behind us. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. we took stops, smoke breaks. We ate. We didn't just walk totally front and back. You know what I mean, it's a show. It's a production. Now, my, my, my recollection, um, because it, and by the way, it's so it's parodied in such mm -hmm. a hilarious, mm -hmm. hilarious way sure. on the Chappelle show. 
But I also remember this kind of being a thing. Y'all always got into these squabbles and fights that felt like, like, I do think without y'all show, I don't know if you ever heard about Zeus and like no, Bat. I, I like, watch all of the bad All of that shit. fighting shit. They got it from us. Of course. And they but the thing is, us. y'all were just really fighting. We like, there, really there was fighting. no security jumping in. None. There was just a nigga with a camera just sitting there like, yo, yeah, we're going to film mean, it. It was really like, because they took away all our personal um, um, communication with our, our, our separate managers and separate teams and gave us all one phone and moved us all in a crib. We had one landline, one cell phone. Really? So you put all those different personalities in one house with only a use of two phones, it's going to cause some friction. And that's where most of our gripes came in. That. It was only until the camera came on where everything became so heightened and we, we end up throwing blows. But beyond the scenes, and when the camera was off, we the best of friends. It was only because when, when the camera's on, everybody's on 10. Yo, you and that nigga Freddie P was fighting all the time, man. All the like, time. <laughs> Yo. But that's what I'm saying. Off camera, we was, you know what I mean? We was like, you know what I'm saying? Like, we was real cool. Like, I went to. Oh, it wasn't that tense off no, camera. No, it wasn't that tense off camera. It was only because we knew the cameras on, so we was more self conscious. Mm. So if we, if me and you just cracking on each other, like. Yeah, now the cameras you on. You black nigga, yeah. you this nigga. You, it's like, oh shit, the camera. What you mean? Yeah. What you say? Yeah, yeah. Everything is a little bit more heightened when True. the camera's on because you self aware of the camera. You don't want to be seen like you in a bad light. When they air it, because we don't know what they air. The editing floor is the editing floor. So the same time y'all was watching it every ten o'clock Thursday, the group was watching it to see what what, what made the editing floor. Yo, such icon. I, I, mm. I remember y'all fighting mm-hmm. a couple of times, and I'm like, yo, me and Fred, <laughs> me and Fred for like three times. And the reason why we fought is because when we would do the little, I don't know, talk about Zeus and Betty. You know how they do the little. Testimonials, confessionals, yep. The confessionals. So they would twist our stories around. So they would make it seem like I'm talking shit about Fred and his 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 testimonial. Then they would make it seem like Fred talking shit about me. So by the time we see it on Thursday, now we on ten when we see each other. Oh, so the 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 episode the show is make, making the show. Act, the actual show. Oh, these days they yeah. be shooting the whole thing and then no. you will see it. Oh, okay. So so every week you're seeing like, oh, word. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. Damn. So that's how it would be. And we put us against each other all the time. And I felt outnumbered because I was in a group with outside of Bab. She was the only East Coast rapper. We had Dylan for the for the Caribbean flavor. We had Sarah. She was the songstress. Then I was in a group with two. Southern rappers, one from New Orleans and one from Miami, Fred and Chopper. So I felt like kind of outnumbered as in being the Philadelphia and the East Coast rapper, where I think a bad boy more catered to the East Coast, but they was trying to open up this whole new plan with bad boy South. So they was ushering that kind of talent through the band in the kind of way. I always felt like uh, uh, Diddy when, well, we call him Diddy now, back then Puff, I felt like, because there were other footages that came out where, like, I remember, you know, he talked shit. He would yeah. just be like, yo, y'all got, y'all got eat us the monster. Like, he'll take your head off. Like, no, like sure. he, you, no, he, sure. would, he would always kind of position you as this is a guy who will show you the talent and rap. So I always thought even if the band, because the concept of, like, we don't even see hip hop groups now. Fun fact, they had all the members of the group. Not until I came back and re-auditioned and made the group. They already had all the members already. They really? they came back for me specifically. They didn't think that they had enough talent to move forward with the competition. I got picked out first out of forty thousand auditioners. Jesus, and I auditioned twice. So being with that said, Puff seen a lot of leadership qualities in me. I was twenty five at the time. Me and Sarah was the oldest. That's why, like, uh, I dropped the uh, um, Ness and Fr- E Ness and Friends album maybe like two years ago to commemorate the twentieth anniversary and the making a band album. Got Benny the Butcher on there, Freeway, Benny Siegel, Vado, Corey Gunn, Zy Sosa. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Got, got, it, got everybody on there. But make a long story short, we ended up selling 500,000 records. We, we was on uh, all, the, all the memorable shit that you would want to be on around the early 2000s, mid-2000s. The Rap City BETs, the Basements with Tiggers, the on the, fun, the on the Couch with 106 and Park with Terrence and Roxy and shit like that. We got to do... Uh, Soul Train with Don Cornelius was still alive. You know what I'm saying? We got to do The View with Barbara Walters and Star Jones. We got to do The Source Awards, one of the last recorded Source Awards. Hey, hey by the way, I was, I was such a huge fan, not of only the story, but the music too. Mm-hmm. I was, and, and you're going to have to explain to me what happened afterwards, because you're right. You guys sold 
Like, first of all, that would be like crazy about numbers now. Right, right, right. But right. what you what you guys told then, I remember even seeing the, the video, bad boy this and bad boy that, yeah. bad boy reaching out with a baseball. And all oh, y'all went crazy. Crazy. We ended up selling 225. It was the, the egos that played a major part in the group's dismantling because we would miss, certain people would miss flights, miss certain meetings. And at the end of the day, Puffy just found a way, to, you know, for everybody to, you know what I mean, just back out of the deal. So you know, me, Babs, and Chopper was selected to stay for a probationary period. And a lot of people don't know. They think, well, he jerked y'all around. I ended up getting a second deal on Warner Music Atlanta Group in 2006. Really? So up into, from 2006 up until 2009, I was recording for a solo deal. And that's when battle rap started coming back in. That's when I ended up battling the mic sign. And that was my resurgence and my reintroduction to the battle rap realm. Wow. Man, um, it's a lot. Of, it's a lot of shit going on. A lot of shit going on. Yeah, no, no. Like the the, mm -hmm. the the group to me was was um great. I loved all y'all for what y'all like. I always thought I thought Chopper was always slick. I thought he was dope. I'm um, rapping. I thought Freddie P was raw, and I always thought you had them bars. You know what I mean? Oh, I think sure. Babs was just a fucking you know like she was the epitome of like a gritty New York chick East who really Coast, give it up. New you know York, what I mean? It's, it's, from the same trenches. E same energy you would get from we a Remy Ma. Though we was like, I was like a little. X Men, Avengers type yeah, of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. We all had our little superpowers. We all had our strengths. We all had weaknesses. So, 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 how are you taking this when, when you know, again, this is starting to unravel now? Yeah. Because okay, there's egos coming in. I've always just heard this where it's like, you know, once you kind of get on a little bit, now you're like, uh. groups never last long. We look, we look back on hip hop. Groups never last long. EPMD, Wu Tang, Outkast. Goody Mob. Look, look at all the iconic groups that never lasted over the like over the span of four or five albums. You, you know, publicly, people look at it and say, really, this group was just a way for Puff to embarrass people. They remember the cheesecake moment, yeah. and they're like, of course it wasn't gonna gonna last. These these guys weren't really treated or portrayed as these artists that people should respect. So, of course, in, you know, all there is, like, there's a moment on the show, I kid you not, I always say this is an epic moment <laughs> in, in, in reality TV history. This is when you realize Puff is something else. That nigga came in and, he, and, and they told us, yeah, they can't use studio right now, there's a fight. And then he's, he, like, he looked around. Who won? And he said, oh, who won? <laughs> That's real nigga shit, though. <laughs> and, then, and then. But I'm a Scorpio, <laughs> Scorpio, I mean, Puff is Scorpio, too. So that's some shit I would say. So, yeah, but no, yeah. what he said afterwards was crazy. He said, no, listen, he man. Said, we got some shit to bring back. He said, back. man, they got all type of technology. And he said, never stop yeah, recording. Never stop recording. They got all type of shit will bring a motherfucker back to life. And I learned <laughs> that day, they don't give a fuck about you or your talent. You're just somebody that's sitting in the slot. Mm. And if you don't maximize that slot that you got, they're going to replace you and fill your slot. No ditty. With somebody else, yeah. <laughs> but but, but in, in those moments, are, are you feeling? And even afterwards, you know, I'm, I'm um, and I, listen, we're gonna get. To, we'll talk about you right, know right, uh, right, right. Diddy and some other stuff. But like, right. I'm telling you, I used to be such a huge fan of this fucking show. Okay, what was it about it? Because from the consumer, because we was we it was, was inside. It, what it, what it, was, it was it about the, it? it? It didn't feel like production. The authenticity. It, fe it felt like we were watching some actual niggas. That had talent, but we're going through real life shit. But that's what I'm saying. The energy coming off this show, the hip hop culture didn't receive this. They re they perceived this as underprivileged or people that wasn't um, appreciative of their opportunity that was given to them. Mm. Some people was conflicted. Some people thought we got jerked over, and some people think we didn't work hard enough for the opportunity that was given to us. What did you think? Because I think some people will look back, and maybe because of the reality show aspect, they're like. Now they were kind of exploited because they look at rappers now and they don't have to do that. You know, we were exploited, but the game is always lopsided. Artists are always going to be at a disadvantage. It's not the, the, the music industry is not designed for the artists to win. You only win is when you become a business owner, you have, when you develop your own artists and you know, I mean, kind of run your own company, being an artist, you always at the lowest level of the game. That's why I'm independent and always been independent, even when I was on a major. I always took their money and dumped it back into myself and invested back into myself. I just love rapping. I just love hip-hop. I'm like you. I'm a hip-hop purist. I watched it all the way from the beat streets, the house parties, all the way up into now. The, so NY Drill, the to NY Drill, to Chicago Drill. 
You know hey, I mean? hey, that, that's so. You, you, what you just said is, is like so important, yeah. but 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 it's so it, it's sad though, right? Because it is sad. W- what what I believe that the majority of consumers believe is that what they're watching with rappers is that the rappers is at the highest totem pole, and that the executive for the rapper works for the rapper, and you know the rapper gets ninety percent, and everybody else you know gets the ten percent, and. After you get you go through the process, you realize no, you, yeah. you, you, it's actually opposite. I think people um, understood what was going on. I think people under like, as far as I'm concerned, me being in it, I understood because I was already 25, and this shit was my salvation. Because what was waiting back in Philly for me was just jail time. So I was like, I was you was just doing street <laughs> shit. Well, why why'd you go to jail? I mean, I had a drug charge. Just coming from Philly, coming from single parent home and coming from public housing trying to keep up with the Joneses quote unquote yeah. you just end up and fall into those pitfalls selling drugs and doing the wrong shit even though I started off with an academic career going to an academic college preparatory school mm. just fall into that peer pressure trying to fit in and be accepted by your peers wow so even though I was a nerd in school I was coming back to the projects trying to be a thug and trying to be a gangster end up selling drugs and end up getting caught for it wow and it followed me Okay, so so you kind of understood it a bit. Still, I, I feel like the industry chewed you guys up, spit you guys out. No, they did. Do, do, do you feel like, and even doing it again, you know, obviously the show was such a tremendous an opportunity, but do you feel that maybe if you, if somehow you got through the competition and was like, hey, here is Enes, the solo artist. It would have fared better because yeah. it felt like all you guys' fates were tied together. Yeah. So it was like when people miss meetings, it affected all of us. Where I was really to, you know what I mean, move forward. You know what I mean? Move forward with whatever. Uh, basically, fulfilling that contract and propelling and, you know what I'm saying, myself further into the stratosphere of hip-hop superstardom. But that was my first task. They was coming to me behind the scenes saying, we got big plans for you, Ness. This is your first um, task. Complete it. It was completed. And I was made good on my promises. I was, I was gave it, I was rewarded another music contract. We first started off with Universal. That's what the band album came out on. But for two years, Puffy didn't have no distribution. Then I had to wait until he got distribution from Atlantic Warner Music Group, and then he gave me my solo deal. Mm. And then 2009, everything everybody think he dropped me, or the business went bad, or me and Puff fell out. We never fell out. It's just under the um, stipulations of his new contract with um, you, um with Interscope, he couldn't take none of the old roster to the new situation, mm. which was kind of cap because he ended up taking Cassie with him. But we all know why why that happened. And, and, and we'll get to some of that, but uh. Mm-hmm. So before then, um, again, I, I'm wondering what, what what was your demeanor? Because I think even now, you know, for example, like, you know, MTV, all they do is reruns. You can watch Ridiculousness and, and, and Wildin' Out all day. Why they don't run the bands of the... Re- you can't find making a band anywhere but on YouTube. Like, on YouTube, you can't find it. And then, I've you know, I, I, I listen to, you know... I was wondering what was even compensation for that because that's like to me it's like classic shit, man. They run it like a they run it like a nine to five. We get forty hours, we get a check every week. Every year it moved up. We had three seasons. So we first started off getting a thousand dollars per week check, 40, 40 hours, then we got five hundred dollars per diem. Then every season it moved up five hundred dollars on everything. So the second season we got fifteen hundred per diem, fifteen hundred every week, and we got a thousand dollars per diem. And then the last final season you know, I mean, it was 2,500 for 13 weeks. We record for 13 weeks every season. But, but there was no, um, because what we were thinking about, because these days people are big into ownership, this and third, like there's no residuals. Like I said, right now, if that show is to be played. We would never, we would get no residuals. You would get no check. The only reason we get residuals is because we did writing on the actual album. But from the actual show, it was all making a band. It was all MTV influence. We had no... Once we signed that initial contract for the audition, that tied us in and gave Bad Boy and MTV the option, the option to um, exercise their rights and, and options that probably y'all were always in that contract. Wow! So it was a favor for him even giving me a second deal. He kept me up there from '02 to '07. I've gotten rap, writing opportunities. I wrote on Press Play, which Did actually you take got, your publishing. No, I own my publishing because I was signed to a production deal. 
So I, that's how I knew Puff really fucked with me because it was a lot of red tape with attaining me for the group because I was already signed to a production deal. Mm. So Black Key, the actual beats that we rapped over when we all freestyled, when Puff came to the crib with Loom and they brought Mysterious and Mina back, those was my beats off my beat tape from my producer. Mm. Then when my producer tried to sort um, compensation for his beats, it was turned down. And then he came back, well, I got Ness in the contract. So they had to do business with the production deal. So I was never signed to Bad Boy directly. Mm. I was always signed through a production deal. So it was like a more of a partnership. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's something I never knew. So it was a lot of red tape. So we had to go back and forth, lawyer, lawyer, negotiation, take that part out, put this part in. But I, that's why I knew Puff really had plans for me and really seen a big potential in me because anybody else, they just would have scrapped it and find somebody else to fill the slot. Okay, now maybe it's because I'm speaking as in 2024 of mm -hmm. how would I would talk mm -hmm. to a, a, a new artist. For sure. But given even what you said, you guys are getting paid per diem, um, you know, at least favorably. Yeah, we live in rent-free, room and board is free because they're actually finding the properties for us to live on every season. But that, that show is doing massive ratings, though. Massive ratings. I think Puffin and me, 40 million. 40 million? 40 million. No, hell no, nah, nigga. I, yeah, yeah. 40 million, bro. Oh, hell no. I would have to come out with an allegation on that nigga, too. That, oh, was <laughs> that was Puff's. Yo, what? You got to understand the time, he was coming off that the J-Lo shit and all that. So it was like. He was lit. He was kind of doing a makeover in front of. Oh, he was flipping it. Oh, this is after 99, after yeah, the, the whole shooting yeah. thing. Shine gets out of there. He sidesteps that. What best way to that to give an opportunity to some. Some ghetto kids from the fucking hood. That was the first time he tries to do the brother love right. makeover. You know what I mean? It was it was brother hip hop back then. You know, hey, I'm giving everybody opportunities. Damn, you know, some real shit. Puff get a lot of flack, but as far as a musician, forty million though. Forty million. Yeah, how you know that? Man? You because I that. seen the paperwork. What? Because I was cool with the the MTV execs, the guys that was the production, the people on the cameras, the people, the script writers, and all that. I would go and leave the house and go to Bad Boy to the offices and talk to the marketing director, the um the media people. I would do that. We would have media training. We would have etiquette classes and all types of shit, physical training. How to hold a fork and shit. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> hey, you know, you know, and you know, I'm referencing what's going on now. Yeah, you know, what I've been saying. Where the fuck has Fonsworth been? Fonsworth was around that time, Fonsworth right? is from Watts, Southwest Atlanta. They call that Swats. So, um, you know, I don't know where Fonsworth is, but what I do know... How was his... Hold on. Me? Let me tell yeah. you the story about Fonsworth. Here we go. Kanye West is a friend of mine. I knew him over 25 years. Yeah. I invited Kanye to the Making the Band crib to submit beats for our album. Fonsworth rejected him and told him that we couldn't have company. And then Fonsworth ended up signing the good music two years later. He didn't even know what Kanye was. Really? Crazy, crazy story. So you knew Ye. I knew Ye. Ye was down to come to the crib. Damn, yeah. Ye was You hustling. gotta understand, Ye was living in New York. If you watch the uh, the yeah. Netflix special, yeah, he was yeah, in yeah. New York at the time. So he was moonlighting as a producer under D-Dot. And D-Dot was a bad boy, you know what I'm saying, Hitman producer. Yeah, yeah. So Kanye was getting off his beats under D-Dot. Like once it get his on, that's Kanye's beat. But it's D-Dot to get the credit for it. The song with Jay Z and Beanie. Once again, it's on, nigga. Seagull hard like corn liquor. That was Kanye's beat, but D Dot, the one who shopped it to the artist and got it placement, got the placement. So at that time, you know, uh, Kanye had produced Beanie Seagull's first album, The Truth. So I was going up there, fucking with uh, Black Key, fucking with Hip Dog. I was already going up there freestyling, battling uh, J Hood, going up the Yonkers. I already had new Kiss. I already had new Styles. I already had new Sheik because of my um, affiliation with Black Key, Hip Dog, and DMX and his placements on that album. So I already had new, familiar with New York. So I was already to get on with my life and become successful. I was through with the, you know, the paying dues part. So I was like, come on, let's get on with this competition so I can start my solo career and get this shit moving. So wait, so how's that? How's that conversation like? So are you? Uh, is Fonsworth like a handler at, uh, of sorts at that time? He's at that point a den mother, someone to keep the band in order, keep us. You know, he I mean? reports to Puff, exactly. but he's the day to day, day to day. Exactly, he reports back to Puff everything we did as far as recording studio, physical training, whatever we that day entails. He reports back to Puff. So when he says no to Kanye, are you just looking at it like, oh man, this he's not a creative motherfucker. I'm he don't, telling he, the nigga, he, like, he don't, you this, don't know who that is. Exactly. I'm like, yo, bro, this is yay. He about to be the next th best thing since pants with pockets. 
He was like, I don't care who the fuck that is. Y'all can't have no company. <laughs> and he got home. Did y'all have a fight re- bef- right before they could? Because no, that's how it's perceived. Every opportunity y'all could have, y'all fought, and, and it had to be some consequence, so y'all fucked up maybe other things that could have happened. That's why Dave Chappelle made a parody of the show. Every yeah. time we fought or got in some, it was shut down the studio. That that was real life. Every time we get in a fight, our punishment would be shut down the yeah, studio, we can't record. So that was true to, to what Dave Chappelle played out on his show. But it just was like we was considered kids. You know, because, you know, the bad boy staff would sit around and watch the dailies. The dailies would be the film from all day from filming this. And we only could take the mic off when we was ready to go to sleep. It was a 24-7 round really? o'clock job. Yeah, you want, and, and the reality show, the only time you could take the mic off and, and, and stop being recorded is when you go to sleep. As soon as you wake up, you got to be re-mic'd up. Because y'all like, fuck bitches? Yeah, we can fuck bitches, but we had to take the mic off take the mic off and we had to go into another room and I'm saying away from the camera yeah, yeah, yeah. And anywhere we went it's not like how it is now in our social media a fight happened or a fucking battle or a fucking anything that people pull out their phone back then people was petrified so upon entering clubs in different department stores we had to have clearance or they had to sign off on it and a lot of people didn't want us come through with the cameras they're like oh man y'all with the nut ass bright ass cameras so a lot of club owners didn't want us to come through because of the tension that we brought with the cameras and the whole production behind us. Because we in the club, it's, it's, it's regular party patrons. Yeah. We in there with a whole production, with a motherfucker with a clipboard and boom mics and everything. And motherfuckers like, what the fuck is going on? Yeah, you fucking with the vibe at that point. <laughs> yeah, it was hey, like that. Um, you, you know, I was listening to, um, I was listening to Dylon uh, and interviewed it. And Dylon mad at me, so I got the story fucked up. Story goes, Dylan to me was a ghost on the show. He never showed up for performances, different recording sessions. He really was on the album. That's my brother. Yeah, I'm yeah. talking in a spiteful fashion. He's supposed to do live later on so he can we can reconcile this, these differences we got. But he, on the actual show, Dylan was a ghost. He never showed up for a lot of the... Why was that? I don't know. You can ask him. But it... As far as I can remember, the day we was recorded. Was he getting paid? He was uh, getting paid the same as y'all, yeah, right? he was getting paid. So what was more important that he didn't want to show up? I don't know. Because you're looking at this as an opportunity. You're over here, you're ducking off from your probation for this shit. Guess what, though? When we found out that he was still getting paid for every performance that he wasn't showing up to. He was missing performances? Yeah. And our management was pocketing the bread until I spoke up. I said, hey, what about the cut that Dylan's supposed to get? They like, what you mean? I'm like, what you mean, what you mean? <laughs> That's my group member, and who gets that bread? Because it's six of us. So we They were acting to- like they were paying him, but they weren't. The man's was just keeping it. Pocket in the bread. So we end up getting the money whenever Dylan didn't show up. Each other five members would break down Dylan's cut. So it got to a point where we appreciated when Dylan didn't show up. Really? Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm thinking that he probably didn't feel like he was, you know, a part of y'all. Dylan is from Grenada. He's, he's, he's Grenada. Yeah, yeah. He's from Grenada. So I don't know about what was came to light. What well, maybe that played the part with with all the, you know, what I mean, the sexual behavior and all that shit. Because you know, you from the island, y'all don't really, y'all don't really swing that way. You know what I mean? And y'all, wait, wait, wait. They had some some shit about him. Like, no, no, no. I'm just saying, oh, like, yeah. people from the island. Yeah. Jamaicans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trinidadians. Yeah, we don't know about Yeah, yeah. They don't do the thing. So I don't know if that's... That's not gay, is it? No, I'm just oh, saying... Oh, wait, wait, oh, okay. You know, the rumors. The r- oh, I never heard these rumors. No, I'm not talking, talking about... talking about the rumors, bro. I gotta Google this shit. No, not him. Oh. Huh? Wait a minute. Nice. The... No, I'm just gonna... We're just gonna move forward, but... Okay. You know how y'all is, man. Y'all don't really... Oh, okay. So, so, so maybe some other shit was going yeah. on. He di- he distanced himself because he didn't want to be associated with certain things. There you go. You okay? You, you, you okay, 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 okay. Not on my bad. I missed the student. You know what I mean? I was like, yeah. And again, this is not to you know. We're not talking spiteful because this is my brother. He just was a ghost on the show. So when it came time to do the the, the Dave Chappelle show, he just didn't show up. Why was he made like a? Oh, he didn't he didn't show up. Yeah, but he to well, he's saying that he was told that we had the day off. But why would he, me, Sarah? He was like the subject of like all the jokes on there. 
That's only because he didn't show up. We asked Dave. Dave, Fred didn't show up. Dylan didn't show up. What are we going to do about these two members? Dave said, don't Why worry about it. Show up? I play them. We don't know. Why wouldn't you show up for the Dave Chappelle show? The hottest show. Bring me back to that time. That show is the hottest show. The hottest show. They walked away from 50 million. That's how hot the show was. I didn't understand the knowledge behind not showing up for the taping of the Dave Chappelle show. We actually taped the show. Yo, I remember that. On Park Avenue, we was living in Diddy's penthouse. Diddy had a three unit penthouse. It each had three stories in each crib. So one unit had three stories. The unit we lived had three stories. And Diddy lived on a unit above us, which had three stories. The way he had tamed the crib, he used to live there as a tenant. It was up for sale. And he bought it and kicked everybody out. Hey, I, I remember that scene so well. And be like, yo, be like, yo, Ness, you just going to do taxes over there? Exactly. So <laughs> he didn't show up. Your so chopper just going to pick your head? <laughs> if Dylan would have showed up. chop some onions? Chop some onions. Xavier, <laughs> you just going to use your anytime yeah. minutes? So that was like the whole playoff. But we asked Dave, what are you going to do about the members that couldn't make it? Dave said, I'm just going to play Dylan. So wait, okay. This is just, so explain to me. So... Y'all show, does he write the sketch or the, uh, so he does it that day. That day. He that just, day. he just improvised. Okay, that person in there, all right, cool, I got some shit. Exactly. Wow. And, you know, we actually, you know. Now, Dave Spells is a fucking genius for that. Genius, man. We, you know, yo, Wyclef, he actually had a track on the album. You know what I mean? He did a um, cameo appearance in the actual parody also. Yeah. So, you know nah, what I mean? I'm going to be honest with you. I think that forever, and I heard Dylan talk about it recently. Yeah, he said he it fucked up his career. Yeah, because people people actually think he said the things that Dave Chappelle said. No, it's crazy. Who's the top five rappers of all and time? Never- <laughs> Dylan, that's crazy. Yeah. So, oh my god. Basically, what I'm saying is Dylan got a different story of how it went down, and you know, it made for good TV. I you know, it. classic TV. Uh, so. You guys have residuals on the Chappelle show for that? No. Once we entered the um the Actors Guild, there's so many years you have to um put money back in for your license and for your union to be in the union. Whenever you're on TV, like we was on a lot of TV shows, so you, it's like you, you have to pay union dues. It's like an Actors Guild. Even though we're not actors, to be a TV personality, you have to pay an Actors Guild. So once we start, once our, our volume kind of slowed down, then you have to renew everything. Your actors guild every year is like a yearly thing. It's like your license and shit mm. like that. So we wasn't paid. We was paid like quarterly for maybe about four or five years for the, for the show. But then it just you know it, it, it'll dwindle down to small percentage and just pennies on a dollar. I seen there was a headline saying that you know it's not like you have anything bad necessarily to say about Puff, but mm. you did feel offended. You said he gave y'all seventy five hundred a bus. I was out. wrong. Fred recorrected me. It was seventy five thousand. Oh, okay. I was about like seventy five hundred. Is 75, crazy. Seventy five thousand. Fred corrected me. It was seventy five thousand. But what is seventy five thousand between six what, members? What, what was that money for? Our advance to live. So your advance for the contract you guys signed into as a as a group was seventy five grand for all six of us. Damn. But I held off and made them. I thought he just gave y'all a bonus, like Christmas bonus. Niggas, here's seventy five hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> no, it ain't work like that. But by me um, understanding the language and contracts and reading my contract, that I that signed, was the advance. That was the advance. So I was like, you know, I got to do a little bit better than seventy five k. Yeah, that, that's kind of so low. They doubled and gave us one hundred fifty k. So we each got twenty five racks a piece. Mm. Okay, so how's the demeanor and how's the relationship with the group overall with Puff? How Puff is treating y'all? Because also, this is we're talking about like. Puff at that time is on mogul status still. Mogul like status. he's he's a mogul. Um, he's living the life of lavishness again. He yeah. just came off dating J Lo. Is is some of those things trickling down to you guys? So idea behind our group was supposed to be a super group. We were supposed to be the new improved version of the Fugees. Mm. That was his whole idea around the band. And then you see where the island flavor comes from, Die Line. My East Coast flavor, the down South flavor. It was like a gumbo of all these different styles. So um, we were supposed to be the next super group. So his idea was to make self-sufficient artists. Artists that can record themselves, mix themselves, go to the clubs, make relationships with the DJs, get club DJs to play their music, get radio (laughs) DJs to play their music. So he was trying to build the more self-sufficient artists that 
at that time. So we was, a lot of the things that we did was because he couldn't do the day-to-day with us. So a lot of the training and endurance training we went through made us a little bit better to go promote our product out in the world without him having to hold our hand. Mm. So how was his demeanor towards you guys? Like, was it? Was it was it always, a- we was always made to be like the kids, like the kids, the kids. And we, we used to get mad at that because we was all like young adults. Mm-hmm. who was in our 20s. Chopper was the youngest out the bunch. That's why he acted the way he acted because he was the youngest. So he always got a pass. But the rest of us was, you know, we was young adults. And the demeanor was, they treated us like kids. And um, they just had us isolated from a lot of our um, outside communication with our friends and family. So we spent a lot of time around each other. But as far as the the kind of the relationship between label and artists, we was always coveted. We was kept away from, I would say, quote, unquote, the wild parties and, you know what I mean, kind of like, the negative side of the industry. We was always heralded as big kids. They're wholesome. Keep them wholesome and keep them young as possibly long as we possibly can for the product. Keep them away from the free coughs. Like, yeah. hey, um, so uh, Aubrey O'Day from Danity, Danity Kane, I think she's been the most vocal. Yeah. And she spoke about her time with making a band and, of course, you know, um, Danny D. Kane and, and for her, she felt like she was done wrong. She was exploited and probably some other stuff. And when, when I listen to that, I'm like, I'm wondering, like, I feel like you guys, you know, you probably have done interviews along the way, but I think now is like a time people are like, no, we do want to hear about you guys' experience because shit, we just always thought that people would just disappear and go away. This shit been and happening we never- since the beginning of time, though, act. Motherfuckers, if you watch Cadillac Records, Lil Walter hops out the car and blasts somebody in the face for pretending to be him because there's no social media. So back in the chitlin' circuit, you could just move around and act like you was an act just because you can sing a song, just because you sing. With social media, we can't do that. We know who is who, and we can trace their background, their paper trail. So basically, what I'm saying is, once you put us in that position, all we have is the contact with the label and with each other. But being that I'm from Philly, I'm so close to New York, when we're recording a show, I can run back home and kind of be a ghetto celebrity on the weekends and then come back and tend to business when need to. So that it was a lot of um, jealousy I felt towards me because everybody couldn't go home like I could go home when, when, whenever I got a chance to because Detroit, Miami, New Orleans, and only Babs and Dylan was from New York City. So they was kind of salty because they didn't get per diem. They getting paid as much as we did because they was actually from the city that we was filming the show in. So you only get per diem like out of town. Yeah. Oh my God. So it was really fucked. We was treated like kids, but we end up navigating it through it and we had a successful album, even though it did go platinum, but Aubrey O'Day to answer your question, it was all different with all of us. With day 26, with the band and with Danny D. Kane. She, she she looked like she took a lot of resentment on the business side of things. Like, for example, if, if you're telling me, well, they made $40 million off the reality show that we created while making a group, if, if, if we're seeing 25000 a piece for a, uh advance for signing into the group. Yeah, but you don't, you don't see how much they're putting into it. They're investing in the production, they're making the band, the MTV, whatever deal they structured. And you got to understand, we get the leftovers of that. You know what I'm saying? So, um... Aubrey O'Day, um, basically what I want to say to her is they actually went platinum. So they had a successful album. So, I mean, when it comes down to that is how much you wrote on the album. If you had any writing credits on the album, that's how you get paid. I think her story was always like, like she's alluded to certain shit. I, I think her story is this. Hey, listen, I feel like I was going to be in this game for a really long time. Right. Diddy told me. I could fuck him and be one of the side chicks. I declined, and my career just kind of fizzled out. I don't know nothing about that, but what I do know is, in the business of music, only one way you can have leverage is if you outperform your contract. When you outperform your contract, then we renegotiate. If you underperform, or you just perform within your contract, you're expendable. You're expendable. 
Aubrey O'Day, they had a successful album. They went on to do a second album. I didn't know if it lived up to the commercial success that the first album did, but they had a nice little run. Once it's over, it's over. That time, that window you have, you're supposed to go on and maximize your situation and go on and do other things. I planted the seed in battle rap. You know what I'm saying? I played the seat in battle rap. I, I, I think you're gonna have a different perspective because she's a female. And well, they claim did he fuck niggas, but we don't know. Um he definitely fucked chicks. Did Bro, you I did though. I did when I signed a bad boy coming from, you know what I'm saying, inner city, looking at that, I'm thinking that's gonna be my 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 end all tell all also. But not until you get into the game. You understand, it doesn't work like that. The mechanics is not the same. So I get it. Being a female and having emotions, you think that this is it. This is this is my road to riches. This is my path to superstardom. And, you know what I mean, I'm going to be Kobe with the Lakers. I'm going to start with the Lakers, and I'm going to end with the Lakers. The, the, does, does Babs and Sarah feel the same way about Diddy? Or, or feel the same way about the situation? Because I have a sneaky suspicion that women might, and whether it's warranted or not, you know, Again, what you're speaking of is, hey, listen, I can't be mad at nobody because I got exactly what I work for. I signed them contracts as a man. Yeah, maybe over time you could be like, oh, I should have got more. But in the moment, I was a nigga getting off parole. I'm not going to sit up here and, and come crying saying I'm just. Yeah, I was just more. trying to be heard and I was just trying to be done with my whole legal issue. Once my whole legal issue, was, it was it was it was to the moon. And that's when I started. Did they help? It looked like they helped resolve yeah, they helped. it. So they, they wrote a letter which yeah. probably didn't get you violated or whatever the case for is. Sure, for sure. And probably helped, you know, kind of petition the judge saying, hey, but, listen, he's doing something good. You know you're not supposed to be outside the county limits when you're mm. on probation, adult probation. So I'm not even supposed to be in New York. So me being in New York and even coming back to Philly to say I was in New York is a violation. They're supposed to detain me from there. Mm. I wasn't even supposed to go back up New York. That's a direct violation. I left the city limits. How, how, for, how like, you know, three happy years, you were. Know, three years back time. Oh, but how happy you were that the judge, like, you know, the judge has to understand the story. Like, hey, listen, okay, I know I know you, you're, you're doing some shit that you weren't supposed to do, but this is going into not only rehabilitation, this is for you to get out the streets. Puff's and make impact was so phenomenal back then. I went from um, maximum supervision to lenient supervision overnight. Really? Like when I would come back from Philly. Did he ever show up to like court for you or like write a letter? Nah, he wrote the letter. The initial okay. letter was it. That's all they needed. Really? Yeah. It was to the point Yo, where I, when, I was coming back, when I was coming back to see my probation officer, it was different probation officers. Just wanted to see me and get my autograph. Really? And my actual probation officer got promoted because he told his higher ups that I was his success story. I ended up getting rearrested for a DUI later after that. Went back up there. Was on probation for like... 90 days and I ended up seeing my old probation officer and he had been promoted off wow. of my story. Because it make it seem like, yo, this guy was under my tutelage and then he went on to be become a recording artist. With yeah, yeah, and he's probably <laughs> taking all the credit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have this motherfucker so good, like, right. he's with Diddy making millions now. Exactly. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about this current climate that is seeming and there's a bloodthirsty, you know, like almost hunger for people to try to rewrite the happenings of the past yeah. and have it with a tint of creepiness, um, ex all exploitation and just criminality. And, you know, for, for a lot of people, it's probably in their benefit, right? Because, you know, some people are thinking, well, shit, if I felt like I deserve a little bit more, maybe I would gain more right now to say, yeah, I ain't gonna lie, them niggas was kind of weird. That's why I really didn't succeed. Oh, they were kind of weird. That's why this didn't happen in my favor. It doesn't seem like that's your story. Puff took a liking to me. He, he kept me up there from, for seven years. He was the sole reason. It, it was up to anybody else. I would have been 86 a long time ago. Puff seen the potential in my pen. He respected me as a writer. You wrote for him, right? Yeah. So he respected me as an MC. So that was always me and his thing. Bro, you say the craziest shit. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, we recorded the Press Play album on Star Island. And we wake up, Shaq. Really? Dwayne Wade, Brandy. I was down there recording. Wait, what year is this? 2005. Oh, they had Star Island back then? That nigga yeah, rich for a long time. Cover. You said 2011. That was actually incorrect. He had the property since 2005. Glory Estefan's 
property is the first ones. All Star. Oh, Island. he bought the 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 the, the, the uh, adjacent one. You're right. Yeah. You're right. Oh yeah. yeah. Thank you for saying. I got to correct so that. All the, all the units on Star Islands are by numbers. So yeah, yeah. You go to the gate. You got to say the number unit that you you coming to see. So Gloria Estefan's was a number, and then Puff's a number. But if you don't if you don't not talking the right shit, you are gonna get shut down at the at, at the um checkpoint. Holy shit! So I, I, how was even that? Shaq lived there. Pitbull pulled up. The, this, yeah. I think Shaq still has a place there. Yeah, Shaq sure. was over there. Brandy was over there recording for the album. Keisha Cole, Pitbull. It was like a who's who. Show up to his crib all day, every day. Chefs, maids. Why do you think, you know, like, you know, I, I see you do another interview. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you, your detail and your experience, it's right. nothing like out of the ordinary, it seems. Why do you think other people ain't talking? I think that's what people are like, yo, wait, wh wh why isn't people saying, hey, listen, if the guy's a music legend. Hey, we've done some music with him. Yeah, we've been to his house. Um, it's not like we're going to vouch for a motherfucker's like right. innocence or not, but right. we can just tell you we ain't seen no weird shit. Yeah, that's all I can really say. I really can't judge. I can't condemn the man. There's no charges being brought up, but what I'm saying is when I was around, and I've been up there for seven years, I didn't see no suspect type shit. That's just my testament. I Did can't. you see the gigolos come to fuck Cassie? No, she was quiet. She was real standoffish when we. When that was the most around. shocking shit on earth. What? Nigga, I read the law. Well, well, Cassie followed. It was like, yeah, that nigga would just bring fifty niggas in to come fuck me while he's jerking off in the corner. I'm like, like Puff had to tell y'all some stories. Like, yo, last night, I Playboy. Remember, last was, night, Playboy. Cassie I was, was lubed up, jerking Ryan off. Ryan Leslie. Ryan Leslie. That's how I met Cassie through yeah. Ryan Leslie. That was his girl. That was his girl. Shit transpired. She ended up being Puff girl. I never ask no questions. I'm too busy trying to be nah, on. Nah, you see what happened. Puff Debo, that shit. I'm trying to be on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So one of those, like, this is one of those mind your business type shit. It was mind your business. Philly people good at that. You know, you know, the, you know the number one thing they would tell me about Philly? They said, they say, stay out of Philly business. And when somebody tell you this, no matter what's going on, stay out of their business, most likely they're going to stay out of yours. I think that's just the, just the, 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 the thing to say now. Everybody say gang members stay it too. Stay out of crip business. Stay out of blood business. No, no, no. I've only Everybody. heard it in one city. Stay out of Philly business. <laughs> like I don't know what Philly business is. I've never heard New York niggas is so messy. You go to Chicago, they say the same shit. I go nah, to, hell no. you go to Texas, they say the same shit. No, them Chicago niggas, they'll put it online that you get in their business. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're different. Philly's a little bit, but yeah, okay. So Philly is is a big market as far as music, but what you don't understand is is small. So. Um, like really you could go through Philly in 30 days from 95 um, south to 95 north Philly is like 45 minutes each way so it's not that really small so it's a real competitive small circle of talent and hip hop cultured people when we say stay in Philly business it's just it's it's just I be thinking that I go everywhere means, and they say that stay out, of, stay out of our business stay out of Chicago business yeah. stay out of Texas business stay out of Dallas business stay out of Austin business it's the did, same did shit. he ever tell you to stay out of Star Island business because nah. that's what niggas is thinking Star I, I got my deal actually flying my, on my own dime flying down there getting a hotel and by me knowing all the different specifics of how to get access to Star Island I pulled up my own on my own dime went there the guy that checked with Ness Diddy over there. I went over there, pulled up, and just had a heart to heart with him. Do you think I'm an asset to the company or not? He said, You're a big asset to the company. Wait, you just pulled up on Diddy? Yeah, to Star Island. No way. I swear to he God. He invited you. No. You just showed up like, Yo, let me, I just want to talk to him. Yeah, I was following him online, seeing his whereabouts. Really? And, uh, I mean, found out he was going to be in um, Miami for the weekend. Went down there. Went down there. You know what I mean? Got a car, rental car, drove up to the checkpoint. They already knew my face by coming through with Puff. So I got the pass, knocked on his fucking unit. They let me right in. Holy shit. They let me right in. Be honest with me. After Puff you, never tried me. No, no, no. After, after you've seen all these allegations, you know what I would say? How come I never got an invite to the freak off? I heard Ja Rule was there. I heard Usher been in them. How come... It's not that you you would have went, but nigga, if I ain't get like if put like this, I'm gonna think niggas think I'm pussy if everybody get invited to go spin them other niggas blocks and shoot it up, but they didn't tell me. That's crazy. And they done it mad times. <laughs> Give me the invite. I'd be like, nah, I, I gotta do something for my moms. I don't know. I can't answer that question. I just was never invited to this. Now I went to parties, but party is not really my thing. So I was invited to the Super Bowl, all types of shit. It's really not a free call from to go down there. Yeah, so like you never know when the free call. There gotta be a dungeon in Star Island. You never know when the free call is gonna go down. 
You just got to go to the party, enjoy yourselves, and then leave. That's it. You know what I'm saying? It's people that's looking for that type of I feel energy. like everybody do know a little bit more than they're, they're down to share. Because you know what it is? Let me tell you this about guys. I always said this. And it's actually that nigga's brother right there. One day I had a side chick in college. And I'm going to tell you, this was like my eighth chick on the roster. I'm fucking mad, bitch, at the time. I'm that guy. I'm a DJ. I used to fuck this bitch. And then I used to be just bragging. Because this is what niggas do. You brag about your sexual ex space. Yo, this chick sucked me off so crazy. Anyway, I bragged so much that till my homie was like, well, it's like your eighth bitch. It ain't your main bitch. And let's see if she going for me, too. You telling me that y'all ain't been just like, just, just chilling around. No, we had some D parties, but it was parties with us. It wasn't parties. But Diddy them. probably slipped up and tell you, like, I ain't going to lie. Last night, we brought a nigga from Opalaka. He had the biggest dick possibly. Fuck Cassie right in front of me. No. <laughs> no. That's what he was into. Ah, man. It's just like, I mean, I got what do you more, think when you I got more that, that energy where... You know what I'm saying? We talking about fucking bitches. We ain't talking about that type of shit. You ain't never... So, all of these allegations you ain't never hear nothing of. Of course. I, I mean... No, I, no, no, no. I would I'm, be I'm, dumb to think I never heard anything. But I'm talking about as what came out as of late, I never heard about the that that type of shit. The jerk off in the corner yeah, while never, the niggas is piping? I never heard about none of that shit. Cassie never told you, like, yo, I ain't gonna lie, I fucked five niggas last night, Diddy Wild, and tell them to chill. Nah. Nah. You ever spoke to her? Yeah, I spoke to her. Jesus. She was cool. It was mad cool. I was Sweet. watching. I was watching the whole thing. And I'm like, yo, I'm wondering if, like, and this is where like I'm like caught in the interesting crosshair because I'm media. Okay. Anything salacious. If they told me that you done fucked three midgets, I want to post it. I want to believe it. You might have never for you fucked because them. you cover media. That's that's perfect for you. Hold on, but media makes the most of salacious shit. For sure. Unbelievable shit. For sure. So when you hear allegations that a nigga mm -hmm. is doing X, Y, and Z outside the norm, you want to publicize it. It's going to get more traction, more money. But then I've seen some people talking about it. They're like, well, yeah, Diddy's billionaire and he's of course had these wild parties, but everything's mostly, well, not mostly, everything's consensual and there's no weird shit going on. I've never on seen a culture where the heterosexual male <coughs> worried about the sexual preference of a non heterosexual male. Like, if you're not gay, why worry about if somebody's gay or not? If you're not gay and you're heterosexual, just have heterosexual sex and, you know what I mean, tend the, to your business. The, the, the thing about that whole situation is that we then, it brings in so many people. Like, for example, before I ever got in this shit and when I was watching now, mm -hmm. I would be watching those videos where they said, I told you, you got to be Illuminati to get in this game. You ain't see Jay-Z throw up this and then Rihanna did this and then Beyonce. I'm like, okay. The same thing. You know, so, so you want to believe when people are in positions of power, sometimes there's gatekeepers and certain rituals that happen. So what's, what's happening with these allegations now that people are like, oh, this is debunking the industry. Oh, so there like there's probably rappers who had to compromise their sexual integrity. They, they might be like, "Yo, I'm the hardest nigga from whatever city, but I did he want to fuck one time, and I'm gonna get like you know what I mean the platinum album. I might have to just do it one time." It's how bad you want it. It's how bad you want it. But but you don't think? Do you think that exists though? Like I, I'm still looking at it like, "Yo, that sounds crazy." What you and, hear? What you hear? I can't. I can't imagine that a straight rapper would do that, and I can't even imagine that somebody would even give you the ultimatum. I wouldn't either. I feel as though the same way you feel. But when you come from poverty and um, fucked up circumstances as far as financially and your family, niggas don't want to go back to that act. Niggas are willing to do anything not to go back to the hood, being broke and not being able to take care of their family. So they might compromise their sexuality if it comes down to it, if they want it that bad enough. Have you ever Me, been I love music, but I would never be compromised in that way because of my musical uh, talent or prowess. Have you ever been at a crossroads, and Cat Williams spoke about this a lot, right? You ever, you ever been at a crossroads in your career in life where you felt like something, maybe an opportunity, and it doesn't have to be with, we're not speaking about necessarily, it could be any, anybody, just, you know, any right, right, person right, of right, power. Right, right. Where it was like, hey, listen, 
if you do this, and, and it doesn't mean, oh, no, you fucking let somebody fuck you. It could be like, yo, <laughs> right, right, you right. do something that's unethical to you. The public right? humiliation ritual. People okay. think walking for cheesecake was a public humiliation yeah, yeah. ritual, which it was to some extent. But then, you know what I mean? Compared to what they wanted us to do, that was lightweight. What do you mean? Like, they wanted us to, 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 to do the whole college hazing thing. That's why we was real big with the college. We did a lot of homecomings. Our album came out September 30th of 2003. So when we were tour, we did a lot of the homecoming. Oh, yeah, I get the fall and the spring. So bang, peep it. Because we were being hazed on TV, a lot of the college kids kind of related to us because of the hazing that would go on when you were trying to join fraternities. Yo, that's so interesting. You know, hey, listen, well, my man here, he's in fraternity. <laughs> I'm not in a fraternity, and, okay. I, I, and I would never... You don't allude. understand what I'm saying, though, bro? No, no, no okay. yeah, yeah, well, well, you know, there's swords and secrets. Hey, okay. I do know certain people mm -hmm. who have been in some fraternities or try to join, and I remember a friend told me a story. They said, well, we got told to, you know, I went to school in, in New Jersey, to go to New York, and they put them on some crazy, it was like a... Something hunt. Uh, scavenger. The, the scavenger hunt. Scavenger hunt. And it was like, hey, you don't really have money. Like, you have to make it happen. Yeah. And that's kind of what... We did that, too, on the show. We did a scavenger hunt on the show, too. Yeah. And, yeah. But, but, but th that's kind of along the realm of the walking for the cheesecake. Yeah. It, it's, yep. it's, that's the hazing, right? It's the hazing. Mm, that's kind of interesting. But at the time, hip-hop was so bravado... Yeah, if the hazing came off kind of like we was belittled and kind of punked on TV. Yeah, like oh yeah, if they were, if they was really tough and gangster, they, this not happening. They would have walked off the show and told Puff, "Fuck you." Mm. But who was ready to do that? Me and Babs was already in our mid twenties. We was already ready for that that moment where <laughs> you guys we, ever had like an argument with like either Puff or, or just like uh, the the people on the show, like yo yo hold on man, what the fuck is that? Like this is like all the time, really, all the time. We had a lot of fights, a lot of fights, a lot of disagreements on, off camera. But it was always heightened when the camera was on. When the camera was off, shit might roll off your shoulder. When the camera is on, everything is up. Everything is on 10. So are you in the belief that, maybe not in every situation, but there are many different ways that you will be tested as you try to attain For the sure. journey For sure. of fame and, and progression in, in music. And yeah, maybe there's a portion where it's like an executive wants you to fuck them. And maybe there's an, uh, money is the last thing to come. You'll be famous before you be rich. And that's, that's the conflict. That's, that's a powerful statement. You know what I mean, so you have to deal with the ridicule of being in the hood of having the notoriety, the popularity not having the finances or the resources that goes along with that and you not being isolated, everybody being access to you, being able to touch you. That's a recipe for, for destruction because you end up falling in the same things, the same pockets and pitfalls that you wanted to get from by, by, by expanding on your, um, your talent and trying to make something of it and get out the hood. Mm. It's like a revolving door. A lot of people that don't make it big and, and the hip hop end up going back to the hood and falling into the same shit that they was doing before they got big. Fetty Wap. It's true. See what I'm saying? Unfortunately. Look, look at the level of success he rose to in that short yeah. amount of time. I, I interviewed him. He said there was a time he looked in his bank account, it was like 25 million just sitting there. See what I'm saying? And then There's we There's nothing guaranteed. So when I did making a band, I didn't think that this was it. I think this was a stepping stone. I'm going to not use it, but I'm going to use the facility, everything that I can absorb from Puff, being the mogul that he is, being in the game so long, and being the, um, a playmaker and a trendsetter, and step off and do my own thing. You, you know, right now, he's getting hammered, and no Diddy on Diddy getting hammered. Sure. But, you know, even, and this is a, this is surprised me a little bit, not saying people should come out and defend his characters, his, his parties, took, or whatever. I, the I fuck. got a lot of flack for that. People think some people think I'm defending them. Some people, think yeah, I'm no, not. I, I seen that people yeah, be like, yo, yeah, yeah. yo, yo, the chat must have cleared. Enes been going around <laughs> defending him. Um, but but you come across to me like you don't have a story that would match up to what people want to hear. Yeah, and, and, and I guess what I'm trying to ask you is, you know. Even if people don't want to stand up for, because I don't think you have to stand up for his character. I do want people to be like, like, and this is my question to you. What, like, what's one thing that you learned from him that kind of stood with you as you moved on in your life and your career? 
either something your you friends and your family are going to be the biggest test. Really? You know what I mean? To your dream. They're the ones that be the ones that drag you the most. It's normally going to be because of them that it doesn't happen. And this is why I've stayed resilient over all these years of the things that I learned being up under him and absorbing the game that he gave me. I became a better writer because of him and a better musician. That we were, we was we was made to write five verses for every verse. So that's how I become with punching out the freestyles and coming up with the content so fast because he made me a stronger writer. So we would come with one song. So I have to write five verses for the first verse, five verses for the second verse, and five verses for the third verse. And they would pick the best verse out of all of those verses. So at the end of the day, I'm left with 12 surplus verses. So he strengthened me as a writer, strengthened me as a musician, and he made me write to beats I didn't particularly write, which helped me become a better writer. So when I heard something I actually did write, it was much more easier and much more faster. So I learned a lot of stuff from us musically, business-wise, and being shrewd and not always taking the deal or the money that's up front or, or working out some shit on the back end where you've seen residual income as far as just being rewarded up front. One thing I've always seen from him on like a music level is um, passion and work ethic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, did he fired up about music or fired about up about winning? It, it seems like a infectious thing it for is. people around him and I could imagine if you're seeing someone who's so you know I always say this you can never you can never envy someone who has more than you if you don't work harder than them and that's what I want to get the point did he got them loafs and got all that money because he stays up at weeks at a time not going to sleep not getting no rest and his body has taken a toll on him over these years from doing that chasing them bags down doing all these high power meetings and sit downs and just chasing. And we had interns with fucking, I had an internship at Sean John at the time we was recording the show. All these things is coming to place. But if you're not going to work as hard as him, you're not going to get the type of money and success that he's attained. I seen a nigga stay up for two weeks at a time, not sleep, not one time. Yeah. Me, him, I seen, we was on a promo run for the press play album. So I actually left with him in Philly he did a party with Charlie Mack, and I just threw my bag on a bus, and I was with him through the whole promotional phase of the Press Play album. The nigga didn't go to sleep the whole promotional tour. He never rested the whole promotional tour. He was up for 30 days straight. D did he introduce some really unhealthy, like, bodily behaviors? Yeah. Uh, there was a time where, where he kept even saying, fuck sleep. Yeah, he don't, he don't get no sleep. And you were around the witness. He got ulcers and all that shit because of it. Mm. Yeah, him, 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 sleep deprivation and all that. That's how you get them loafs. If you never lower your amount of sleep hours every day, you never gonna become a millionaire. So if you if you count it, if you step more hours than you was up, you, you never gonna be successful. So if you get eight hours of sleep every day, you ain't gonna be up like that. You ain't gonna be Diddy status, J status, nowhere near there. We have to lower your amount of sleep hours because once you do that, you up ch chasing the bag. Your gears just turn, trying to get some bread. But if you sleep, there's more time you ain't plotting and planning, strategizing. Has any federal authority tried to talk to you? No. I don't would think you would you have, or do you think you would even have an information that they would be interested? I don't. In? I was just remo I was removed from 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 that type of energy, and I said time and time again. I said it on other platforms. I mean, I just can't be forced to say something that I was wasn't exposed to. And I mean, and, and I mean, we all heard stories and the rumors going in. Yeah, yeah. So I would be, at, you know, what I mean, I would be on the fence about a lot of things. But I was in close quarters with him plenty of times, and it just was on some big brother, to little brother apprenticeship type shit. It wasn't never one no weird, uncomfortable feeling, and that's just my testament. I can't speak for everybody else. Yeah, and it's probably super unfair because people want you to say something that they do. They really be dragging me. Even I was on News Nation and she brung up the seventy five hundred and shit. I'm like, we supposed to be talking about a certain things, and they, they can trick you up real quick and fuck your words up, and it could come out and people can see it in a certain light that's not really you know what I mean privy to what you want. How do you want to see yourself? All because yeah. of something you said truthfully. True. Yeah, <laughs> that's the power of media. Um, battle rap. Uh, you know, you pivoted to battle rap. Mm -hmm. Um, 
not like completely, but as part of what you do, because you are someone who your style has kind of been very, you know, almost made for battle rap. For and sure. you're from Philly. Yeah, the content. Yeah, the yeah. content. Yeah, just aggressiveness, the assertiveness, and being that I battled Jay Mills on the show, that was kind of like my um, introduction into battle rap. I'm going to be honest with you. So that, <laughs> I think, so th that was highly um, discussed. Mm -hmm. And about who won. Yeah. But theoretically, I think a lot of people thought... It was Jersey Boy saying who won. No, no. Well, it, he was supposed to watch you. That's what it was said. That's what it... That's, that's what's supposed okay, to happen. Okay, yo, I, see, now I know you know your shit. Because he had a reputation of killing everybody. Yes, yes. So being that I went the distance with him, and, and it was and, like a kick and, in his armor at the time. And then some people was like, basically, you edged him. And then some people said he edged you. Yeah. But regardless, it's a conversation. There's two extra rounds that they played, that YouTube footage came out, that actually it was a sudden death. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's when people was like, oh, no, no, this nigga eating that's for real. For sure. You know, like, you know, because sometimes, you know, they're watching the show and, of course, highly entertaining. But once they see, oh, this nigga get busy with the niggas who really in the streets that would do it. And obviously, they, they didn't know your history from actual Philly. Uh, they, they looked at you different, but I, I felt like that was almost like a fucking platform for you to be in battle rap whenever you want. The only thing about the battle rap, I didn't want to be stuck in that category, in that box, because there was a thing going around, battle rappers couldn't make records. So I wanted to do away with that whole myth. Mm. Puffy was actually um, asking me to do the rematch of uh, with Jay Mills, the third season of the show. I declined, because I just didn't want to be put in that category as a battle rapper, yeah, there was a time which was ironic you... that I ended up going back to it over no, no, well, that probably was a good, it, it was a thing where like, once you like, you know, for example, um, Sirius Jones is one of my favorite battle rappers. Serious murder movie. Right? Yeah. I would hear early Sirius Jones records and I'm like, not, I, you know, like rapping wise, I think, I think yeah, right. but because he got so renowned in battle rap, rap yeah. they wouldn't allow him. To, it it's would like be like, yo, all right, that's cool, but get back to this. <laughs> like, you really yeah. a monster over here. Right. So, so, so maybe the timing on that, because they were really, they were almost looking at rappers, right? People who rapped on a beat mm -hmm. as like this either different type of sport or different ability. You couldn't do both. Yeah, they tell you as soon as you come, like, as soon as you show up and become a professional, they say that battle rap shit stops here. That's not how we... Make records. That's not the business of making records and show business in the music industry. We need something we can sell. Yeah. So all the content of coming at the listener, they removed that. Battle rap is more coming at the listener, more bravado, bragging about yourself and almost belittling the opponent. Yeah. But in the music of business, you have to make it a relatable record. So that's why the club records is more bigger than the street records because yeah. everybody is in a good mood. The drinks is flowing, whatever. And people could kind of like relate to the same mood and the same record, same chorus, same energy at the same time. Battle rapper is like more selective. You have to be in that mood to look at battle rap. You have to be in a certain type of energy to, to encompass the energy that comes with battle rap because it's like, it's in your face. Niggas is spitting, rapping, all that. Niggas is talking about personal shit, baby moms, fucking kids, you, moms. You ever got one of these situations where it almost came to blows? Because I, Yeah, I, for sure. Plenty of times. Because I, me, me and Jay Mills, I rematched Jay Mills on ARP. Shout out to ARP. It's another battle rap league. I'm, I'm from out of New York. URL being the main one, ARP, yeah. King of the Dot, which is Drake's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So I bad on ARP, which is That's uh, how I found my disaster. For yeah, sure. I, I, which uh, we, did the, we did the uh, rematch and uh, some words being flown and got real touchy feely. It was almost about to come to blows. Yeah, what's even like the protocol? Mill's my like, guy. Mill's my guy. What's the protocol there? Like the guy, the person could get up in your face, they're kind of spitting a little bit. It's like could, WWE. Could, could they routine. touch you? Could they grab your hat, throw it up? They like do all that type of shit. It's only about what you want to allow and what you don't allow. And then now, and now they're, they're, and they'll be talking real spicy. If I seen you in the street, I would have clapped you. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's yeah. crazy. People talk about people's mothers, uh, handicapped, autistic people, gay, all, all types of shit thrown in. And it's like, you gotta really know what you're getting into when you when you when you dive back into that realm of battle rap. The only thing I've always, you know, uh, I, I think it, I think it's a really exciting exciting sport. I always just wonder if it's only about the performance factor, and you can't like you know you see with a song, you record it, 
and then you could perform it a million times. Right. And then people could stream the original recording of it. Battle rap is a variation of that. Win, lose, or draw, they paying Enes for a performance. I have a certain style that I bring, a certain energy. But you can't bring. give the same verses elsewhere, though. You can't. You can't. You can't. If it's not recorded. If it's not recorded. So what, that's but why, that's everything's why recorded now. Everybody's a fan of battle rap because it's always supposedly be new material that nobody's never heard. And you all should be going at an opponent. So it's like a back and forth thing. It's actually more com- in, um, comparable to comedy, if you ask me. For sure. Stand because, comedy, you know, it. yeah. yeah. It, w- w- with a comedy set, people will see how, you know, if you perform the same thing for a while and then the special comes out, and I guess that would be the battle type shit. No, for sure. So battle rap, you know what I mean? Sponsors that came in, exclusive vodka, Puff was at one of my, my my biggest battles, which was Summer Madness 2. I battled DNA. Puff was there. Buster Rhymes was there. Mickey Fax. Is um, he putting pressure on you at that time? Like, yo, you better win, man. I'm in the building, man. Like, They didn't even tell me he was going to be there until I showed up. Really? Yeah, it ended up being a disadvantage. Because I battled DNA, and he was, telling, he was kind of referencing all the... Oh, he was referencing a lot of things. That's probably hitting a lot harder because Diddy's in the building. So everybody was looking up at Puff. They're like, oh! Where the walk? Yeah. yeah, you made him walk with yeah, the cheese. Yeah, yeah so it's hitting like a little. That. Okay, okay, damn, that's kind of interesting. So I was man. put in the box after that battle. So I've been trying to climb out of that, that kind of like energy around my name ever since. But uh, as of late, I've had you know what I mean, pretty good battles, pretty good numbers, twenty four million views on Verse Tracker. You know what I mean, so you know what I mean, battle rap is a, it's real kind of like acquired kind of energy what do you enjoy doing more now um i I use it as a platform to reintroduce myself with the younger generation Mm. because people that don't know me from making a band they see me in the street like battle rap ball really real shit and it it blows my mind sometimes i'll be like so you don't know me from nothing else they be like yeah i just know you from battle rap bro battle rap and your freestyles on the gram which gets me into my another subject being older in the game you have this certain window being from philly if you don't go through this certain window people kind of count you out. So my whole resurgence of dropping the freestyles, going viral, doing the challenges on the gram is to show people, as long as you love your talent and you, st- and you swore to stay sharp, you're going to always have a cult following, people that follow you, buy your merch, come to your shows and pr- um, um, support you. No, that's, that's fire. Yeah. Wow. And so- with the resurgence of guys like Benny and Conway, older guys that yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of, kind of, you know what I mean, didn't get their shot when they was in their young 20s. They're starting to get more notoriety and more publicity and being more celebratory now. I'm kind of representing that whole thing. The, maybe I'm glossing over it, but you know what I was also thinking about as, as I watched, you know, 50 himself just went on that final lap tour, which is pretty much like a G-unit, like... For sure. You know, and shit, apparently it's about to be the third highest hip-hop um, grossing tour of all time. And, and I was thinking about that, I was like, yo, we, we have to see that for Bad Boy. And when we see for Bad Boy, we want everybody, you know what I mean? Of course, the people who are alive, right, um, that could, or are free, that could contribute. And I would have loved to see, you know, and, and, did I miss it? Like, I don't, I don't think it happened, did I don't it? think it happened, but it's only in hip-hop where it's... Yeah, I would love to see... We deal with ageism, so it's a c- certain age group that's going to only come to those shows. People that work in people, working class people. But now you can charge guys. more money. And I think that's why 50 Show is, is, is one of the highest grossing. Because if you got For if sure. you got kids, if, if there's kids coming to your show, you could sell out the garden, them average ticket price is going to be 40 bucks. 50 Cent has transcended, though. He's also been able to keep up with the time and stay consistent and stay relevant. True. To where he had, he's bridged that gap from young fans to older fans, such as myself and older. You know what I'm saying? So... He did an excellent job at that. That's like the the most difficult thing. And he used TV as as a tool Yo, to bridge that gap. He's a hustler. And I used battle rap as a as as a tool to bridge that gap. Now he's a hustler. I remember there was a time where, you know, um Puff found himself with the liquor. Fifty told me the only thing that kept me from, from success was Puff. He told me that at Coney Island. Wait. I seen Puff like a couple couple months ago, right before the year turn, up in Coney Island. DJ Self do this party out in Coney Island every year. He has certain big artists come through. Last year, the year before last was 50. That's when I went to go see 50. 50 showed me love. Uncle Murder was there. Everybody was there with him. 50 don't I, look at you no type of way that, you know, you were. You're, you're, he actually showed me love. Really? He actually, you know what I'm saying, showed me a lot of love and gave me a lot of insight into the game. Mm. He told me that was the only reason that I didn't 
go as far as out oh shit is because of him. You don't believe that though. I mean, he he would have more insight than I would. Well, well, you can't believe that if you believe that. I can believe it because he was a, he was a, he he was an exec at a time. He ran G Unit Records, so he's getting the same information that all the execs get, mm -hmm. as a Leo Cohen, a Kevin Lyles, a Puff, a Jimmy Iovine would get because he's an actual exec. So it's that's what separates rich people from poor people. Rich people receive the information before the actual public does. That's why when COVID hit, all the rich people knew they take their families on vacation before the shutdown came through. That's a good point. That's the only thing that separates rich people from poor people. The information and access to the information before the actual public gets it. And 50 Cent is, is, has access to the information that the general public doesn't have access to. What do you think the beef is between Puff and, and 50? Like? I think it's Daphne, but I don't want to... No, it's saying. definitely Daphne. I think it started with Mace. And that's why I think you're, you're in an interesting place. I was because with Mace. I mean, I was with Diddy when I asked him when he when Mason was trying to get from off a of bad boy onto uh, G Unit. Yeah. And I asked Mace, asked Puff, what he owe? No matter of fact, I'm like, who that Puff? Because we was in his crib in in, in the Hamptons. He, he got a big ass crib, Tony Montana in the crib, swivel up to the motherfucking um drive through. You know, got the big ass fucking phantoms and shit. Got the fountain in the front of the shit, fucking cathedral steps. Big ass wide door. So I'm in there. This is when he first moved in there. The high ass ceilings. He got the Papa John stoves in there that you can make pizzas straight in his kitchen. You know. Really? Yeah, he got that type of shit in his kitchen. I've been to all Puff's properties. All Puff's properties. Make a long story short, he was on the phone with the G Unit guys and Mason was trying to get the deal done. And he was like, yeah, Mason them keep calling me. You know what I'm saying? You know what I mean, I just told him, give me what he owe. And I'm like, damn, Puff, I mean, respectfully, what do you owe? He said, three. He said, give me these three. three. He can do what he want. That's what he said he owe. He said he owe three. Puff gets a lot of flack for operating in an era where I think, you know, I don't think he started that, but business was being done a certain way. But I think people look at him worse for it because you have the same skin. You you're, you are the guys you're signing. You're, you're not Leo. Fucked up perception about the music game. You, you don't get paid. You have to ask your money. You have to run it down. You have to stalk it like fucking Jason and Freddie in your nightmares. <laughs> they don't give you your money. You have to ask for your money. You have to fucking track your money down. It's always going to be lopsided. So yeah, we deserve more because we the talent. And we don't want us putting the blood, sweat, and tears. But it's lopsided because they are taking all the financial risks, putting the money into your project behind your, your talent. They the ones that are taking the financial risks. So they they hold all the cars most of the time. You only have leverage when you niggas like Master P, niggas that sold units out the trunk and already made money. They already want to. They don't want to want you to make the money on your own. That's why they try to get you to come in, do an album, take you off the road. They don't want you to make the show money, and that's where we have the 360 deal. Puff is the creator of the 360 deal. Really? Every deal is designed after Puff deal. Puff deal's lawyers wrote that deal up. Really? Yeah, he's, he's the purveyor of the, he's the architect behind the 360 deal. Because a lot of labels was losing money. With these artists, they wasn't doing the numbers that they wasn't doing. I thought I was selling the physical copies. So they made it everything 360. The merchandise, the shows, the touring, all that comes within your, your deal now. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I would have to do my fact checks, but I know he was one of the big campaigners for, for the 360 deal. You know, I I, I, I look at that 50 and, and, and Diddy relationship, and mm -hmm. it's just so interesting I think the Daphne thing was Puff finally responding back. Like, I had heard some shit that Puff had did some shit with, like, the naming of some shit. And this is the thing. You never get, some with some Supreme you never get team involved name. in millionaire's business. I learned mm. that a long time ago. Because you could talk shit. Like, I could have talked shit up to 50 about Puff. All P 50 would have did was got on the phone with Puff and called him and said, Yo, your man was up here talking crazy. Yeah, I just had your man Ness up here. Mm. Same thing with Jay. Yeah, you talk shit about one of them, they gonna get right on the phone and call each other up. They all cool with each other. That's what niggas don't know. So you can go around one of them and talk shit about the other one if you want to. They gonna get on the phone and say, "I had your man up here talking crazy about you," and I was wise enough to peep that. Hey, something's going on in the industry though. 
Jay has fell back at the right time. It's like, yo, go. He, he told his wife, go do that goddamn cowboy album, that little uh, uh, country album. I'm going to not be seen at all. Like, that nigga said, Rock Nation brunch, get the fuck out of there with that. Something's I mean, going on, and I'm wondering if it's a witch hunt. And, and, I, and I guess, like, you know, for, for younger people and people who are, like, everything we hear now, I feel like every day is something else. You know, and I hate to bring up this case because, you know, this guy's just seemingly creepy guy, like Cosby. It, it, it becomes that that intuitive question. Some people say what Cosby was doing was commonplace in the 80s and the 70s. Like, yo, that's how niggas, that's how they used to get down. It's not that they were trying to do some shit, to, but mad people were doing it. He's just a guy who got caught. Yeah. And then now we're hearing about things, and we've seen so many people got quiet. I think Russell Simmons could have seen it. He dipped to Bali. He's, he's over here like some doing yoga. Some people take, it's taking Jay's, um, um, silence as a sign of whatever. Yeah, like yo, yo, focus on this nigga, and not yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm over here with some people. Blue might see it as a sign of disloyalty due to him and Puff's um, relationship throughout the years, and some people seeing it as a sign of just separate yourself, distance yourself from the shit, because we don't know. You know what I mean, where's how it's developing. How how much can you really be friends with somebody in the music industry? Like like, who do you consider your friends yourself friends with? Like if they their name got brought up on some shit, you'd be like, no, yo, that's my friend. I trust my team around me. No, what about no? What about another rapper though? See, oh, see, it's, oh like, okay, like another rapper. I don't like, trust other rappers. Really? Nah, it's all competitive. Because a bad moment for me is a good moment for you. Subconsciously, if I'm if, if, sure. I, if I'm if I'm portrayed in a bad light, then you can say, "Yeah, I'm not like the rest of these niggas." You see these niggas over here doing that? Yeah, niggas weirdos out yeah. here, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> niggas be on some nut shit, man. So, I be really so, keeping it honest. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? So the energy that came off off the show, hip hop just didn't respect this. They was like, ah, but the music was actually good, and we actually sold over five hundred thousand units. What happened to that second album? So there was a second album supposed so to. So my hood, which was a solo album, I was really uh. Kind of like, I was kind of like, you know what I mean, dragged for not having a solo record on the first album, being that I was the elite spitter, deemed the leader of the group. Chopper had a solo record on the first album. So Puff would always press me like, nigga, you don't even got a solo track on the fucking album. Like, that's just crazy. You don't have a solo track. So I always. Was that by your choice? No, it just was me being a team leader, giving everybody. Chance to touch the ball and shoot it, but he made a he 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 brought something to my attention. Never, ever, ever, ever like wave away the pick. When somebody's giving you the lane to drive and take it to the rack and dunk it, take it. Don't pass the ball. It's unselfishness, but that's not what hip hop entails. You got to be selfish. You got to be cutthroat. At the time, I'm thinking let choppers shine, but moving forward to reestablish myself as a Solo artist, that would have been perfect. So to answer your question, the second album was coming out. I had a record, it was a regional record called My Hood. It was supposed to be all the band members was on it. But then when we got scrapped and dismantled, I took that record to Cosmic Kev. Cosmic Kev played it on Power 99 and made it into a regional hit. It was real big. So that was supposed to be the first single off the band album because we didn't have a, soul, a, I mean, a, a group collective song that Puff thought was good enough for us to put out as the first single for the second album. So my solo record was supposed to be the first single off our group album, the second group album that we got dismantled. And then it just, it just fizzled out. Me and Babs were selected to stay to be a part of a group, which never panned out. We were supposed to be like Bonnie and Clyde. And then Chopper was supposed to spearhead Bad Boy South. He actually came out with a song called um, Lil Daddy that was on the Hustle and Flow soundtrack. I was a huge fan. It was uh, right uh, at the Trina. So he was he was in the the the, uh, the telethon when they did the the, the Trina response, the FEMA shit on BT. Yeah. He had that whole wave. Do you remember the Chopper suit? Yeah, I remember that. that What'd you see the Chopper when you seen that shit, man? No, me and Chopper was beefing. Me and oh, Chopper, yeah, was, me and Chopper was beefing. Yeah, he was beefing. We was beefing because that was my little brother. I was the oldest. He was the youngest. Yeah. So on the road, they would used to put. Two, two of us together in each room. Normally, the girls was together, Babs and Sarah. It was Dylan and Fred. Then it was me and Chopper. So who's that beefing over? This young and oldest. Just a young brother, little brother thing. 
egos and shit clashing. Yeah, egos and him being so energetic. And me like, yo, calm the fuck down, bro. Why you so hype? Yeah. Why you so full of energy and life? Mm. I'm being a grumpy old fucking mid-25 year old that I was. We always bump heads, but we always would, I mean, reconcile our differences. And at a moment's know that we fucking bitches, fucking twin bitches. Here, bring a bitch to, to the room. I'm wake up. I wake up. He got two twin bitches in his joint. He's sending one over to my bed. We, we busting the bitches Modern down. day freak off. <laughs> what, what a freak off. The freak off before he become a billionaire. But we had our freak off amongst ourselves. We would have a little. Now we got to come up with a new word for that. Because when I hear freak off, <laughs> I think about some crazy shit. So we would have our own little moments. But, you know, we had good moments. We had bad moments. But the good outweighed the bad. What's your relationship with everybody now? We cool. We supposed to do a reunion tour, but because of egos and the same reoccurring problems that we had when the show was on, we could never bring it to fruition. Some a promoter contacts us every year to do a re, like a reunion. Let's do tour. like six six plates. We never joints, we, ten. We, we never we never make it to the first show. Wow. We get deposits and all that, tickets, flight, hotel information. We were supposed to like right before the pandemic. We were supposed to do Howard. And we were supposed to do Radio Music City Hall in New York. Really? We couldn't come to an agreement on anything. We never did it. We got deposits and all that. All six members. Well, that's to, sad. We were supposed to do ra the Radio Music Hall in, 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 in D.C. And then we were supposed to do another show in, in, at the Radio Music Hall in New York. We never did it. Same recurring problems. Egos. Actually did a song with uh, Fred this past summer. We put it out. It's on his project. Put out an um, EP. I mean, we did a video. I got a song with Babs is coming on my um, about to drop on my um new 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 project called Enes and Friends too. I got Kid Kid from G Unit on there. Dave East, D Jones, Babs, Fred. Wow, about to drop that John. Well, 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 let's wrap this by just talking about everything you got going on. Like, yeah, well, what's been going on in the life of um, Enes for the last? five, six years, and what's going to be happening? What do you have planned this year I had year to reevaluate my situation. I mean, um, I gained weight. I mean, I went through a lot of uh, health scares, um, with my blood pressure. And, and Is it just getting older or you've been like maybe, maybe abusing older drugs or whatever? And not, I mean, I, I, I had a problem with drugs, but you know what I'm saying? Um, I mean, I went through a therapy. Got clean. It wasn't no hard drugs, no like no cocaine or nothing. I'm from Philly. The culture is pills, lean, mm. shit like that. Yeah. Now it's pop culture. Before when I was coming through the door with it, Puffy was like, "Yo, come on with that shit." But now it's like he in studio sessions with Future with a whole double cup of lean. Yeah. And popping pills. It's pop culture. When I was coming in the game. It was like you couldn't do it. It was like you fucking up your shot. You fucking up your chances. What was like the the drug of choice like back then? Lean, pills. No, no, even when you first came in? Yeah. Zannies. Um, that's what's around there? Lean, yeah. Oh, my God. Perks. Yeah, shit I heard like perks, that. Is, perks is huge in Philly. Yeah, huge. Opioid epidemic. Mm. It's an opioid epidemic. How, how, how did you realize, you know, you so had to lean, kind of... People don't know, know about lean. Lean is a drug. Um, I, I'm, I'm asthmatic and I'm bronchial. So growing up as a teen, I had a lot of issues with respiratory diseases. So I was I remember that, that from the show, bro. So I was that kid that used to like when I when my mother would drop me off to be babysitted, I would have a whole bag of medicine. Like the big bag of medicine, the, the inhaler, the cough syrup, the, the machine, to give myself treatments. I would have all that. So lean was like kind of my way that I would would help me with it. But lean, it robs you of your ambition. All you do is sleep and you eat, you gain weight. You don't be as energetic and, and do a lot of movement. It just robs you that, of your ambition. That's so interesting. You said it robs you of your ambition. Yeah. Which probably just lowers your quality of life. You gain weight. You have probably other complications. Yeah. I, I, how, do you, how do you realize that? Gain weight makes you look older. And in the music industry, you are supposed to look as young as long as you can look young. To appeal to the younger crowd. Uh, uh, how did you know that, you know... Yo, I got to make a switch. My friends. My friends would tell on me. My friends was the one that feed it to me and then go tell my managers and my producers that I was, you know what I mean? The reason I, why I, you I, can't perform right now, yeah, you like, off them joints. But we up there playing Madden and they bring and come feeding me the shit. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they come up to my crib, we playing a game, smoking weed, 
And they feed me this shit, but then telling my manager and my lawyer's like, yo, y'all got to talk to Ness. All you want to do is play mad and sip lean and smoke weed. Yeah. But it's, so it was like, I just had to make a decision to myself. Like, bro, this is my dream. I wanted to rap. I'm a musician. Let me shake this shit and get back on my shit. And Puff always know. He always had an air to the street because he was a real big fan, which is till today, of Beanie Siegel on Freeway. But he noticed after a certain time, they can start having a problem with drugs and start, you know what I mean, affecting their performance as a recording artist. And he didn't never want that to happen to me. So that's why he always coveted me and kept me close to him all these years. Mm. Okay, I'm very, very proud of you. You know, you kicked that habit. Mm-hmm. How difficult was that? Very hard. Very hard. The people kick you when you're down. Like I said, in Philly, there's a small, select few that's even doing music. And, you know, it's, it's, it's like a really minute community. And once you don't go through that window at a certain time, then they write you off. And that plays a part. You get depressed. You start hanging in the hood more. You st- stop recording less. You start really chasing being on your music hustle. Then you become less and less invaluable. And then people see you. Oh, man, fuck. I ain't going to that show. I could see him right there. Or I could go to the hood. He right there. He hanging out. You become more accessible, which makes you less valuable as a star. When you're more seen in the hood. True. Wow. So now, since you've gotten past that. Yeah, but I dropped albums. I, I kept my feet planted in battle rap. I had some high-profile battle rap um, battles. Um, um, dropped music, independent. But music is so fast-paced, it took some time for me to get used to this digital world that we in, social media, and the way it's ran, and the algorithm. So I used freestyles. My manager put me on to doing freestyles. And it took some time to me to get used to them and being consistent with them. And I start seeing my impressions grow, my numbers grow, and engagements grow. And people start interacting with me. Then I start becoming a band ambassador, having, I mean, hot freestyles and making some substantial numbers with the freestyles and the waving the buzz with that. Brand ambassadors would ask me to wear their merchandise during my freestyles and they start paying me. So I start seeing how. Yeah. Social media worked a little bit more. Yeah, because n- n- now it's like, you know, you know, for a rapper, it, it, you know, this is the Method Man say some interesting things. Right. He had said, "Yo, I guess he was commenting on on, on on certain rappers always flying private." It's like, "Yo, yo, how is there so much money?" And it's not necessarily that it's just straight coming off music. It's like these days, there's so much ways to monetize off of fame and celebrity. I didn't want to be that bitter rapper that just was stuck in a time where I couldn't adjust to the climate of, of, of the digital pace that we're going at now. And um, like I said, there's so many ways and so many avenues to make money via social media and just the digital world. Distro Kid, TuneCore, this outlet, that platform, uh, XM Radio, and um, I've owned all my publishing. So when it came time for Puff, Puff to give everybody back their publishing, he didn't have to give me mine because he never owned it in the first place. You ever had you sign an NDA? Nope. Really? Nope. Oh. Nope. Never. Never. Yeah, he must have been like, yeah, this nigga ain't see shit. Man. Puff flew me out. We was over there with, uh, with with Dre and Vidal, with Usher, when he recorded that whole Usher caught up confession thing. Did you see when they were wrestling over the Frosted Flakes? Never. <laughs> you know, that's what it said. You ain't hear that? It's like, yo, every day we'd wake up and Never. rest over the frosted flakes. And I, I ain't like, gonna lie, my whole time. This I, is like a. My whole time up there, I was metaphor. waiting to some questionable shit to happen for me to just say I could walk away with it. And it never happened. That's why I stayed up there so long. I, I, I did, 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 did at any time when you're at Star Island, you kicking in the pool, did he comes over, he calls you daddy, tell you he like how you're moving and shaking? Never. I never Come seen on, that shit. Ask you. Never. I don't know. When I see certain things, I'll be like, it'd be, it be kind of weird to me because he never, none of that sh- that characteristic or mannerisms was ever. I'm, I'm going to keep it a being with you. And everybody know, I'm sure there's a motherfucking era. I am a Jamaican. But yeah. if, if I seen that nigga Diddy done took a... F- Usher, Meek Mill, and a few other niggas on shopping trips, and they came back with matching outfits. I'm gonna start saying, "Nigga, when are we going to motherfucking Saks Fifth?" And I'm gonna get some matching outfits. No, but that's just something that's from the hood that you know. I mean, you, I mean, matching outfits. Yeah, niggas don't do that. 
<laughs> please don't do that. If you come in, if, we, if I see, if I came in with the same hoodie, I would take my hoodie yeah, off. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. it's like it's just like yeah, yeah. yo, niggas don't even want to have the same cologne on. That's what Real I'm saying. Niggas don't even want to smell, smell like this. Yeah, like, so it's yeah. like I mean, that's just a Philly thing. I think that's an East Coast, just you know what I mean, male thing. We don't want to look like or kind of compare me to anybody. You know what I mean? I ain't gonna lie, that one clip when he was saying to Fabulous, he said, yo, Fabulous, man, when we gonna party? Fabulous was like, nigga, we just party last week. He said, no, nigga, what we gonna I agree party with 50 party? Cent. Sometimes Puff get caught up in a moment and he don't understand some of the things he be saying. So and you I, think he's probably just taking out of context? Like, I think he's taking out of context most of the time. Mm. But sometimes... That could be true, too. But sometimes it do be compared to us and where we come from. You know what I'm saying? The hood. You know what I mean? Niggas. We know what niggas going for and what they're not going for. You said you, you know, well, maybe you didn't witness the whole thing, but uh -huh. you seen Cassie come with Ryan Leslie, Diddy, Debo, that. Did, did, do you believe that he blew up Kid Cudi's motherfucking car? I don't know. You think he got that in him? He don't talk like that, dude. I think his name is Brother Love. If a nigga named Brother Love is planting car bombs on some, like, yo, he in Baghdad, like, come on, bro. I'm going to just say this. The first time I talked about Diddy, I was under my car like this, like, I'm looking for, like, a beep. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know how car bombs look Being like. Being in a th game 30 years, you would be a fool to think that you don't have alliances with a lot of people. From the higher-ups to the underworld. That's all I want to say. And Everybody thought that back then, Suge was the big bad wolf at then. And now we start. I swore I thought that. See? You never know who's who. You just got to wait, live long enough, preserve yourself, eat good, live healthy, and see how it all plays out. Yeah, I ain't going to lie to you. Like, I, I've definitely liked the healing that even the whole Shine situation. You know, mm -hmm. Shine, uh, he's a senator in Belize. He came back over. He, he, he showed love to Puff. You know what I mean? So, you know, whatever resentment they had, it had to subside. And I'm wondering if, like, you know, again, man, your life is so long and not everything goes the way we want it to go. Mm -hmm. But when you think about your, your experiences with people who have helped you, you know, you, you're always going to be like, nah, this could have been better. But I've always just thought there is something about someone who could just completely disregard anything you've done for them and just completely only say the bad things. If, if, if your experiences with someone is a mixed bag, that's to me is believable. <laughs> right, if you come right. back, you were chilling with that nigga for 20 years and now you only could tell us all the bad shit that nigga was doing, something is wrong. You know what I mean? Of course, I got some bad moments, but it wasn't to, to the extent of what they're publicizing now. And you've had you've had good moments and moments that you realize yeah. that helped you out, especially you know when you, you were on papers and all that. For sure, like that was a, a defining moment for me, and then I understood that he really had interest in helping me. If, if you were now um, given an opportunity to be on a reality show to cast another rap group. 2024. By the way, we all know it's so rare to even see right, right. A, a rap group now. Right. Where would you even start in what you would look for? Or do you even think that's possible? I think they watered down. To answer your question at first, I would. Because it does wonders for your um, your profile. You'd be the Simon Cowell of this shit. Yeah, so it, it really kind of like, um, <clears throat> I would say, amplifies everything. It makes your... You know, um, your hosting features go, your hosting price go up, your feature price, it just elevates everything. So being on a big platform like that is going to do wonders for your numbers any, anyway. But to answer your question, I would do it all again. I just would be more structured. Like I said, when we was on the show, it was uncharted territory and they didn't really didn't know what to do with us. I would get with a team of writers that would sit down and just do the blueprint and the architect and the architect structure of the show. Mm. Hey, um, but we did influence a lot of like of all the course. fighting should come from us. Of course, but at least we was actually competing and fighting for something. At the end of our season, we actually had a yeah, record yeah, game. yeah, yeah. Like the chicks on baddies, they, they, they just throw drinks at each other and just go home and wait yeah, till yeah, the next yeah. season to start. Yeah, they're, they're crazy. Their, their highlight of their season is um, when they review the season, when they do the, the and season it, and review shows, and, and they fight on the reunion too. Yeah, um, you know, they say stay out of Philly business, but I'm gonna go into Philly rap business. What's your top five Philly rappers? And we're talking about, we're going to approach it from a spitter's like yeah, MC type Yeah, because people of, always got so much different categories. What are yeah. you talking about? Are you talking about success? Yeah. Are you talking about just lyrics? Are yeah. you talking about authenticity? Yeah, are you I'm, talking about this? Like, I'm, I'm, what I'm are talking we about talking about? Niggas talking who give about? it up. Like, you know what I mean. Niggas who give it up. Niggas who really nice. Niggas who, who, could, who could step in any hood and really perform. Do they thing. 
The Beans. Okay. Black Thought. Mm, gotta have Black Thought on it. Cassidy. Mm, salute to Cass. Cass DM me recently. He he dropped some shit. He said, Bars is back, nigga. I got I gotta put Meek in there, man. I'm Meek in there. I put Meek in there. And excluding myself, she don't get a lot of credit. I gotta put Eve in there as a female. I gotta put one Ooh. female in there. I gotta put a female. No in there. freeway. Freeway is definitely there. That's my brother. But I'm talking about as far as yeah, yo, it, 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 it's it's first of all, it, it's just a tough it's a tough thing to answer. You, yeah, because, somebody gotta be left out. I know I get that's, it. That's what I'm saying. Like freeway, I'm only like if I didn't have beans, I would have freeway. So yeah, when yeah. I'm saying beans, I'm I'm really saying freeway too. Yeah, yeah. But beans and freeway almost like they're not in the group. Now you get what I'm saying. You see yeah, what I left yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. we wouldn't have freeway if it wasn't for beans. Well, I could be wrong, but you know I mean, yeah, yeah, beans did a lot of campaigning to get free over there. State prop was you know ridiculous, but crazy. Top ten freeway definitely. Of course, top ten. Of course, um, and we got song. We got song on, on my uh, album as well. Really? Yeah. Y'all gotta get Freeway up here, man. He, be, he, he hit me hit me up. Like, he be watching what I got going on. I'm oh, like, man, I'm trying to. That guy, that's my brother, I'm man. actually mad at you, man. You did an interview with No Jumper before me. Like, nigga, like, I'm in Jersey. I just talked to Adam before I came in here. Really? Yeah. Oh, you gotta go there next. Yeah, he, 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 he was surprised that I was about to do your platform. Oh, yeah, no, no. You, you gotta go there next. Y'all kind of got like a. That's my boy. He coming out here. Uh, He coming out here in two weeks. Yeah, that's I my ain't guy. Gonna lie to me. Like, like we, it's, it's, we have competitiveness, but like, right, it's, it's right, one of those right. where it's like. Like, you know, if we're going to think on a media level, it's kind of like Jay and like Diddy. It's like, yo, I would never want to go to war with them because at the end of the day, we're all like, we're, we're one of the, the two independent media platforms that have just lasted the test of time that there's a level of respect there. But do you get into a little, like a little brush up sometimes? Yeah. But like, yeah, that's my guy. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I've, recently, like he hit I've me. I've been watching you cover this thing. We got to We got to We got to We got to Yo, you didn't go right there. It was good, man. I, hey, hey, that's big. Hey, I'm mad at you. I was telling them because I seen you do no jumper before you did you did you did my show, and um, we we we've been on DMs. We we've been on DMs trying to get it together. What's going on? <laughs> I was out there and my team. Shout out to Philly up, Freeway. I'm, with you, dog. I'm, def I'm definitely going to come fuck with you for sure. No, of course, of course. Anytime, anytime. Fuck all that other shit. I fuck with you. Like, you know what I'm saying? No, no, I know. I know. Yeah, listen. You, 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 uh, people don't realize, like, you've hit me a long time ago just, like, watching the content and be like, yo, hey. And actually, I was just like. Yo, I'll be, I'll be tuned in every day, dog. <laughs> hey, <laughs> and I was watching. I was like. Damn, I'm like, this is somebody who I grew up listening to and looking up to his music. I'm like, so we got to tap in, like, eventually, no matter when. Yeah, uh, sure, yeah. we'll, we'll set it up, Definitely. though. All right. I'll be locked in. We be tuned in, bro. Keep that shit up. Nah, I appreciate you, you, man. I'll be shit without the beef and all that shit. I'll fuck with you and what you do and what you stand for. You know what I'm saying? So. Nah, I appreciate you, man. We going to set it up, man. We going to set it up. Sure. That's, that's my brother, man. I'm happy you got him up there. Yeah, yeah. No, shit, we were going through a lot of history. Uh... <laughs> You know, just trying to get some, like, clarity because, yo, again, for me, this is, like, nostalgic. Like, I grew the first hip-hop reality show I've ever seen, this nigga was on. Yeah, yeah. It was major. Like, it was I remember, major. I remember, I think I'm in high school at the time, and I'm like, yo, I'm, like, fucking, I'm rocking with y'all so heavy. I'm thinking that, like, y'all are going to go on and do some crazy. And also, the, 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 that one song I used to have, and I don't know if, maybe an iPod at that time. I had like iPod, a little, wow. yeah, I had an iPod, bro. Like I had an iPod, I used to bump that songs. You feel me? Damn. But uh, but, 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 but freeway definitely we we uh we, we gonna uh, lock in, bro. All right? I'm about to I'm about to shoot up top. I'm about to perform at that Fat Joe and Friends shit tonight. Oh shit! Everybody gonna be there. Fifty uh, Dipset, the Locks, us shit gonna be lit. Nah, great I'm man. Gonna, uh, hey Ness, give, make sure bro get my number. Absolutely, bro. No doubt. All Got right. you. All right, bless bro. All right, tap in with me, my nigga Love. Mm -hmm. All right, bet. Yeah, so I got the cheesecake business too. I wanted to oh, you, um, oh, switch off the energy. There you go. That. Yeah, I got the cheesecake. Really? Got the nice cheesecake. Man. This is this is why these days, um, 
you know, it, it's so profitable for an artist because you see, when you have a moment, mm -hmm. you get to come with like some good shit right. that, 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 you know, because again, music these days, people sometimes it, like we're in a digital era, people don't buy a song. But if you if you have a dope T shirt with a saying that you're saying in the song, they buy the song. They 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 buy the they buy the, 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 the T shirt and shit. You got some food. You got some nice nest cheesecake. That's cheesecake. And it's gonna fuck with it. Yeah. How long ago did you start this? I always used to we used to try to like distance ourselves from the whole walk of a cheesecake fiasco. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. After a certain while, I get tired of. You, you felt embarrassed of it for, for a while. I did for a while, but then I'm like, that's the ultimate marketing fucking tool. Yeah. If everybody's goes try to clown me about it, why not have a product to go with it? Yeah. So now when you say it, I got it for sale. Now either you shut up or buy it. That's the greatest thing I've learned about the internet. I used to be in my feelings about a lot of things at first when people would say and be like, oh, that's their one comeback. Once you own it, it becomes yours. And the people who want to use it against you, you realize they stop saying it. Or the other people be like, oh, shit, like this thing really fucking with it. Like he's right. embracing like it. Biggie, when he said, heart throb never, black and ugly as ever. He yeah, took yeah. it. He, he stripped you from it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now you can't say it. Like, you already know he. No, of course. It takes the power from the consumer. No, so of that's course. That's what I wanted to do with the Nest Cheesecake. Got my own cheesecake business. Make sure y'all follow me. On How the can gram. they get that? So on the gram, we, we doing pre orders. Particularly with food, it's a lot of red tape. Yeah, Insurance, yeah. Really? Eli, you gotta find a spot to mass produce the product. Yeah. But we got it up and running for the past two years. It's been profitable. It's been gaining notoriety. Took it up on Cosmic Kev. Shout out to Cosmic Kev, Pi 99. Took it on his platform. Freestyle interview went viral. Yeah. It was the first time I uh, premiered it, and it's been picking up. So the way to reach us is through Instagram at the moment. What's the handle? Enes Cheesecake. That's E N. E S S C H E E S E C A K E on Instagram at E Nest Cheesecake. Now this is fire. T -t Tell me this tastes better than Junior's cheese. Uh, I <laughs> would believe it do. We actually on the Hall of Fame and Juniors for the whole really band fiasco thing. We we on the Hall of Fame. Yeah, that. And that also shows you marketing because yeah. you know. Well, first of all, I was a I was new to the United States at that point too because I came over here like in 2000, um, 2000, 2001. Okay. and um, so I'm I'm getting heavy into hip hop. And when that happens, I remember, like, I didn't know what Junior's was. But now that's the only, yeah, cheesecake, yeah, that's right. the only cheesecake spot I know in, in, in New York now. So, you know, we had some negotiations with Junior's. Fortunately, by the end of the year, we would have my next cheesecake in Junior's. Oh, that would be fire. That would be fire. Shout out to Junior's, too. That would be fire. Hey, mm -hmm. people, if you're watching this, man, um, if, if, you've, if you're somebody like me who grew up on, you know, the band, you know, you've watched Enes's career. Please go on that Instagram. Go tap in with him, man. Go, go, go pre-order one of these sure. cheesecakes. Is there um a bigger version of this? Yeah, these is the these are the samples. These are the ten dollars. These are samples. Yeah, okay, these are okay. the ten dollars units that we have. The whole pies, which is twenty five thirty, okay. depending on topping and flavor. Oh, great. Yeah. Okay, that, that's fire, man. Yeah, just I know we've been rapping for a minute, but I just want to get everything out because my team won't kill me if I don't promote everything. No, no, go ahead. It's, it's your time. We got the studio popping, Five Fourville Studios and Podcast. I've been doing my research. Oh, you have a studio? Yeah, we got a studio in Philly. Really? In a podcast. Th that is a good investment. I also see my man Dean. He, he's doing he's doing oh, his sure. version of that too. So wait, so so, so people could if they want to do a podcast in Philly, right? Mm -hmm. Or they're passing through, they could just they like book your studio yeah, and book my stage and rent the space. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm I'm try, actually trying to do my uh, my own podcast. I want to bring a kind of like a, on the radar fill into Philly, what they doing in New York. Although, that's what's that's missing. That's what I, we need that in Philly. We need that in Philly. So I want to start doing that. Bring interviewers. You don't got to rap if you don't want to rap, but it'll be an outlet for the up and coming spitters. They want to get some type of um, recognition and some type of notarization, man. And it's music business, and I want to start making that an outlet. Having that outlet for the up and comers that's in my my area or in my region. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, what else? I'm, I'm giving you the floor, man. I, I, I think we, I've asked you pretty much no I everything, right? Asked everything, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, mom. Just all the thing, you know. what I mean, um, I, I know a lot of people want me to get on these platforms and kind of like denounce my whole experience with Puff. That I'm wasn't, glad that's not your approach. That's not my experience, and I'm just telling. Because, Don't get mad at me because because, I, pe yeah. because people are also going to look at you different if they feel like you're on a bitter tour. Yeah, you know what I mean. It's no win if I get up here and say he, 
he was a piece of shit. People say, you should have did something with the time that you had since yeah. then. If I say he's a good guy, they say, well, he's, you know what I mean? It's yeah, nah, I get it. I get it. Um, I, I think if anything, this highlights you giving your real story. And whatever people take from that is what they take from it. You could only say what you've seen and what you were around and how you got treated. You can't really speak to what maybe somebody else For sure. got from their experience. You know, it is what it is. And also, I think people have to have some nuance when they're, they're thinking about things. Yeah, shit, I'm pretty sure Jeffrey Dahmer, like, used to be really nice to, like, a couple of people, right? Those people ain't gonna be like, oh, yeah, that guy's the... Right, hey, right, right. Hey, I, did, I wasn't around when he was eating them niggas. Like, you know what I mean? I was just only around when yeah, every time he was, was, was open the yeah. watching the game. Yeah, yeah. like, he was always cool. Yeah. He never said nothing weird. He never said, yo, like, yo, I'm about to french fry you. None of that. So, again, you know, he's speaking your truth, and I'm, I'm glad you're speaking your truth, and, and, and I, I think Dallin did hit me, too. Um, I'm gonna tune into y'all live. Maybe yeah, I could join in some shit. Yeah, we do some live, man. Dala, I'm mad as shit. He keeps saying I, I'm lying and I got the facts fucked up. And he was told that he was, we had off for the day, but I'm like, it doesn't make sense. Why would they tell you? <laughs> yeah. The taping of the Dave Chappelle show. Yo, everybody's working, but with you, you're off. <laughs> so shout to Dylan, shout to Chopper, Sarah, Babs, Fred. That's, that's my fucking brothers and sisters always in forever. Yeah, people, up. thank y'all, man. Um, sure. th th this is th These are the episodes I like to do because as we are, you know, pretty much still, even though in, that was pretty much last year, we we're celebrating hip hop having a milestone of 50 years what we're realizing that the age bracket of what hip hop is is expanding. We're seeing Jay Z and others who are past fifty. They're still putting out amazing projects. For they're sure. still active, For sure. and it's turned from oh hey, you got to be in your twenties and thirties to hey, listen, as long as you got a story to tell, there's going to be an audience. And we're seeing that the, the reunion tours are all popping because. Not because someone's 40, and I'm talking about a consumer 40 or 50, don't mean they don't still consume hip-hop. That's what I'm like, saying. Like, there's mad... Like, how many of our uncles still listen to LL Cool J It's only in hip-hop where it's, it's ageism. I hate that yeah, for yeah. us. I hate that. The Rolling Stones keep performing. The Beatles keep... Well, not the Beatles. Rolling Stones, all these old rock acts keep performing. Yeah. Blink-182, fucking Guns and all these things, and they never say, all them niggas old as shit. They don't never say it's only in hip-hop. Nah, that's their era. It's ageism. But, like I said... With you know what I mean, Slaughterhouse, you know what I mean, Griselda, you know what I mean, fucking Jada Kiss, Dipset, the verses, all this shit's bringing oh, yeah. the lyricists back. Th th that definitely. And I like the energy between that you've been covering with Cole, Drake, and the Big Three. And Who with, you got uh, in that? In, in that like you know lyrical squabble? What do you think is gonna happen? I I, I, I think that, I think that boy yo I was last night like I'm going over to like the diss songs and right, right. you know me I, I'm a little biased because I, I drink my favorite but I'm 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 listening I'm like yeah this nigga this nigga Kendrick he's so calculated he's so cold no, he is I was I was because I was watching you covering it, um last night the big three and he was breaking down the lines yeah about the dog the goofies with the check line yeah 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 and I don't know you be the way you decipher it I would want to think. Nah, he, Did they being that cryptic and that deep? Nah, I think but all, man. I, I also want to think that it's a collective uh, agreement between all of them to get the blood. Nah, and, hell no. Nah. Hip hop again. Hell no. Nah. I, I I think Kendrick really on some. I think I'm top dog. This is rollout, though. Every time he did it, he did it before. No, but I when think he came at Pusha T, me, Big Sean, no, Drake, he it, did it, it before. But every I, time Kendrick this K dot disappears. I won't say disappear. He don't drop music. He comes out. This is his ultimate rollout. But let me let, let me let me say this though. I was reading the lyrics of Control. Man, what he said on that shit, it's about his time. So like no, you guys are dope. He, he, he literally said, he said, uh, I heard the talk in the barbershops all the time. They said, who's the greatest? Me. And he says, Andre 3000, Eminem, Nas, Jigga. Then he says, when now he's talking about his peers, he said, the rest of y'all niggas? That's just new niggas. Don't even get involved in this. Gun he's basically he's basically telling them, we ain't fucking with you niggas, man. Gun to your head. Time capsule. If you yeah. was buried with, it, yeah. with one of these three artists, artists material, yeah. which one would it be? Uh, and of course, Drake. But, yeah, but, but like, I'm going to be honest with you. I think Drake is a little bit nervous, as he should be. He's a little bit nervous because I think Kendrick is setting them up for... And, and, and this is where you got to go back in the lexicon of of rap beefs because you have to know 
like there's been many chess moves made that got played out publicly that affected how people thought about the beef publicly. I think both of them could lyrically go toe to toe to a certain extent, but I think Kendrick got a song in his back pocket. And he said, I dropped this verse right here. Yeah. It's, that control it, was dope. I, I, I mean, I mean, I, I, as someone who battle raps, you know sometimes you got to yeah. kill a second in you your do. first you round. Do. You're like, all right, I'm going to, the second so round, I'm murdering this nigga. K-Dot got one in the chamber. Come on. So if K-Dot one, what you think Drake got? Well, well, I think he don't know what he got in the so chamber. Think, he been begging him Drake, to drop it. You think Drake and Cole's first person shooter, is that the beginning to this? Is that the... No, I think K Dot got another. I think he got a. He got a the hard part five or whatever it's gonna be. Can you have one thing without the other? Can you have first? Can you have control without first person shooter mode? If first person shooter mode is never made, do you have control? That's a good point. But here's the thing: <laughs> he's way more direct than they are because I think people have now realized that first person shooter was was like. Oh, y'all were kind of also subliminally dissing him. Right. He's so direct. He said, fuck the big three. I ain't gonna lie. There's something about hip hop. Hip hop is like such a machismo sport that anytime it, it, it's, it's, it's a sport, especially when lyrically, it's a sport of the tough guys. But when one person comes in the room and says, fuck this kumbaya shit, I'm the best. Who wants smoke? That's true. That's the shit that That's people want to see. It's like almost boxing. Well, who gonna. Y'all either gotta knock him out or be pussy and just don't don't accept the fight. So Drake gotta respond. Can in you, my head, uh, I got Drake. But the hip hop purist in me, I'm gonna take K Dot. I think K Dot's if he wins this or however it plays out, is because he scripted this. A motherfucker that don't rap every year and drop two projects a year like how Drake been doing, if he fall back for some years. And he comes out the blue with this. He ain't just come with, he, like he ain't come with a gun with just one bullet. That's true. That's he true. came with a loaded clip. But now he probably knows I'm, I need <laughs> to fire this off, get you to do this. He already got a plan. So I think Drake is trying to sit back and try to figure out the plan. The bar spitter to me out of those three, who is Cole? I think. Hold on, hold on. I, I'm gonna tell you why. Go ahead. If me, K Dot, and Drake, um, and Cole went up to, to Hot Nine Seven. I think J. Cole can go bar, bar, bar for with me. Like, mm. bar for bar. Like, I say a rap, he say a rap, I say a rap, I say a long rap, he say a long rap, I say a long rap. Let me ask this question. I think Drake is more calculated, more critically acclaimed. I think Drake is more a business. I think his shit, he knows what he's going to do. He knows what we're going to write about. He has a more strategy. K-Dot is the more artsy of the bunch to me. I think he just picks his moments when he feel like dropping some shit and getting some shit off his chest. But to me, Drake is more business driven. It's like a it's, a it's a corporation. We have to put this project out, sell these songs. Drake is already unmovable object. It's always going to go whether or not. Let me ask you this question though, because this is how I personally think about like and you tell me as a rapper, is this a thing? I felt that with Drake rapping in the last couple of years, he dropped her loss. He dropped uh, for all the dogs. Honestly, never mind certified love Oversaturation. Boy, right? Not oversaturation, but his pen hasn't been pushed to be in that mode to necessarily badly. He's writing songs. He's, he's writing less on the... When he gets to the mode of, hey, I need to go write a, a 8 a.m. in Charlotte or one of those, what I've seen with Cole is that, especially what he did on the Yachty record, Secret Recipe, what he did on um, First Person Shooter, like you could tell he's in his prime. It's like catching an NBA player... You know, some players, they be drinking, doing whatever in the offseason. They show up first day of camp. They, they, they he even second Drake quarter is dope in. as fuck. It's just with all. I don't the, feel like it's pen writing this moment. It's just moment. with the, all the Quentin Miller and the ghost writing allegations and shit. People send, tend, tend to not, I would say, give him that before that came out. Well, we don't know if that's Drake's thoughts. He's dope as fuck. But being that the shit came out in the past, we don't know what's his material and what was. Material that he worked on and elevated. Yeah, I think he wrote. I, I think he wrote all the the raps. I think the singing shit. He be getting hooks and shit. I, I be thinking that. But 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 I, I guess the, the question I asked it like directly and succinctly. Yeah. D does your pen ever get a like? You, like when you write mad raps back to back, when right. you say five five raps for one verse, right? Yo, your pen at, at that point you working out literally. You're working that yeah, pen for out. Sure. I, have you gone like you know? Let me say you were getting lazy a little bit. It's that third that now you about to write a verse and you're like. And I don't even know if that's the strongest verse just because I haven't really gotten the gym 
sometimes life needs to happen. Sometimes you get burnt out of writing at a high level. And you need to have just life experience, a conversation, a moment, a date, a bad moment, a financial issue, a girl problem. All those is, is a never ending source of material. TV, radio, film, current events, podcasts, other people's song, political issues. Everything is an ultimate source to pull from as being a rapper for material. Mm. So when you say the pen, yeah, you might get burnt out after a while. You might have to just re reset and reevaluate. And life had to, you had to have some life's experience that you could pour back into the music. But Drake's pen is top notch. All three of them is top notch. But I think just Drake is more celebrated than the other two. But K Dot is nice too in his own right. And Cole is nice. He's got song making abilities. These kids spit. Who knows what? I mean, the, the, the situation between them three and why it's all coming out. Because they got Future and Metro Bumin in the mix too with the shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's like uh I think Future just got on the song as a chorus. I think, yeah, you know I mean, Kendrick made it what it was with the verses. I think it was just a, a blanket chorus, don't have nothing to do with the content or with K dot spit about. I don't think none of them like Drake. Drake is the guy, he's the heartbreak kid. I I I don't think none of them like Drake, and part of it is competitiveness, but I think there's something more. He light skinned with wavy hair. No, I think he didn't try to fuck everybody's bitch. That that's too. the problem. That, that's it's a part of it. Like, hey, listen, you you not gonna it's only so much time you're gonna that, that's that's keeping it a beam. Between, I mean, niggas gonna say Drake is easy on the bitch is gonna say Drake is easy on the eye. And and then yeah, 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 and but then he's a singer. Let me ask you a question. Is it disrespect? Are you my man's let, let's say we're, we're you my man's in, in the rap nigga perspective, right? I'm coming Where, from a mark, I'm coming from a like an exec. No, no, if no. If I see no, Drake I'm, coming here in order, I yeah, but but I'm I'm thinking at that level of success, yeah, great. I understand it's Drake, but like Future could go take like Drake got fight twenty he's bitches. Like, he's so 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 the point what I'm trying to say is, I think as men sometimes we look at all right, we cool as rappers. We do songs together. We might have done an album together. I know your bitches. You fuck with. You know my bitches. It's it's disrespect when I'm kind of I'm kind of stepping into your yard. And kind of like, all right, because you could take mine and I could take yours, but it's a respect level where it's like, we not gonna do that. I think Drake is a habitual line crosser. Oh, he is. He's the type of nigga, he he's seen you kissing that, that shorty, he, he knows she not just a bop for the night, he know you kind of rocking with her, and the next weekend he try to have her give us some tickets to a show or some sneaky shit, that's some stink shit. You wanna be mad? Drake be is mad. that guy, man. Drake is he guy. helped you, yeah, but 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 no, these are not guy. these guys' girlfriends. It's just like, yo, this is my stable of bitches. This is my stable of regulars. These are the ones that everybody can have. The community pussy. My regulars, yo, why are you trying to fuck my regulars? I don't try to fuck your regulars. Drake a slimy. These bitches nigga, ain't loyal though, man. They gonna they fuck you soon as you leave out the fuck. When I'm not with my bitch, I don't trust her. As soon as I leave, the moment I leave her. You got dicks in your mouth. And I'll come back inside saying, you had a dick in your mouth, didn't you? While I was gone. No way. I swear. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I keep these bitches in check. You got to. Because these bitches, they be loose. You have to like some type of, you have to have some type of fucking understanding with them because they'll, they'll run free and do whatever the fuck they want to. You have to put the fair guy in these holes sometime, bro. Yeah, th th that's the part I hope that's not happening for real. It would be very sad if we don't get another collab <laughs> album. I ain't gonna lie to you. I don't know what pussy could separate me from the nigga who I'm cool with that I've had three number ones with and like a crazy ass album. Yeah, I'm like, right. shorty can't be, be no, that good. It wouldn't be no beef with me. Once I'm a multi-millionaire and I'm lit, I don't- We got a fuck. diamond song together. have that bitch. I'll go to Brazil and go make a, I'll go build a bitch. I will bring the bitch from Brazil yeah. and have her living in my shit, doing everything I want to. Have her, she, she don't know nobody. Give her Rosetta me. Stone for, for hey. give her teach her English. The only thing about that, you got to take care of the bitch. You got to take the doctor's appointments. Oh, <laughs> that's the trade off. That's the, you got to take you got to take care of the bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, we, well, we 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 actually about to wrap this up. No, for, then, sure, then, for sure, for sure, for sure. Listen, people, man. Yo, please go check out my man Enes wherever you can find him on social media. I want y'all to go check out the Enes Cheesecake. For it's sure. going up. The pre-orders are going in. I'm not too sure. It's probably going to be a limited amount, so y'all got to go cop them right now. 
Uh, go make sure you get your pre-order in. Uh, go check out his music, of course, available on Spotify. The projects, Enes and Friends. There we go. Luda Chemist. Let me borrow this beat. Uh, go check it out on Spotify, Apple Music, wherever you can stream music. And, of course, check out his battles. Check out everything you got going on, man. Um, my brother, thank you for showing up here. Thank you for being on the platform. I'm happy to hear the story from the horse's mouth. And um, I'm just looking forward to what you, you got coming up in the future. Sure, Feel me? Big act. Big act. Come on, man. Listen, it's been another episode of Off the Record Podcast. Thank you guys for tuning in. We're out.